I, I, the way he just looks at it, he has the most pained expression. And that's like the moment where you said, like, you want to come on and listen local? And he was like, oh. uh, No, I mean, my my original thought was who dropped out that couldn't show up that Loco has to come to me? What? No, so, well. Was it Leviathan? Was it that whole drama? <laughs> <laughs> I will say that was whack. Whatever. Are you, you think you could just replace it? one thick man with another thick man and no one would notice? <laughs> yeah. Right, this is going to be episode 21 of Listen Local. Don't know why I forgot the name of the show there. So now I've remembered it. I also will not be making any inappropriate jokes about reaching 21, before we were 21, what this means. But I actually have done by alluding to that. See how that works, local? There's, there's a lot of little tricks and nuances in humor. You can do all sorts of things. So our guest for this episode yeah. is Damien Estrada, who is, you might know him from in the past when he used to work with Team Liquid. Still does, but now he works technically for 1UP GG, which is in some way circuitously owned by Team Liquid, but also produces content elsewhere. Like, come on then, this is, he's going to do this classic thing where it's like, well, no, the, no. Owner, the owner of Team Liquid owns it, but not, he doesn't, it's not Team Liquid owns it, even though Team Liquid is owned by that person, therefore it is basically the owner who does own it. So come on, give me that version, come on. Okay, hold on, I'll give you the version. So 1UP yes. Studios is now ran by Ian Sansevera. Okay, so Ian runs 1UP. He's part of that team. I'm actually fully out of 1UP, and I'm oh, right. Team Liquid's creative director. Okay. So, so I do know 100%. Back. Yeah, yeah, just work for TL. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I help them out occasionally, but they don't really... Is there a reason for that you can give us? Why aren't you working with 1UP one, one GG anymore? Um, do you want, like, the cocky Thorin response or, like, the, the calm Listen, response? Listen, I mean, it's not actually required that everyone on the show emulate me. Yeah, I'm not, like, oh, Jesus, okay. the example for all men. Like, you can you can be yeah, yourself. Like, uh, so the, like, humble response is um, after working in content for so long, like, on the video side, uh, I felt like a lot of the team that I put together could do what we wanted to achieve by themselves. And it's not to say that like we always needed my hand holding or anything like that because everyone was pretty confident. But it felt like there were areas in the org that we maybe weren't like in top shape of or that can improve in some way. And I asked Victor and Steve like, hey, is it a possibility that I transition over to care more about like the brand and merchandise and like the messaging perspective? Way less on messaging, way more on brand and merchandise, but like who we are and what our identity is. And so over the last probably like three or four months, I've been transitioning out of 1UP into the role of creative director of Team Liquid. Okay. Right. What about this then? So let's, let's obviously, we're basically going back to the start of where we were in the conversation anyway then. So people know you initially from your work with Team Liquid. Obviously, Team Liquid was one of the first, not the first, but one of the first, especially in the LCS, to have content that was behind the scenes and reality series following the team, et cetera interviews that aren't done by third party people, et cetera. You know, these, these were all things that weren't that widespread back then. I know now, you know, even in EULCS the last few seasons, there's been a whole bunch of teams that had the reality series and that sort of things. It's generally a blueprint people thinks a winning blueprint. So you guys weren't the absolute first. So what, what do you think as an abstract, not specifically Team Liquid, as an abstract concept, what do you think of this aspect of orgs making their own content? Not like, you know, someone like me making it or someone else who has like a production studio separately, like 1UP GG in theory became, you know, if they do work to someone else. What do you think? Um, I think now it's become like a necessity, right? Like I'd say when it first started out, uh, it was definitely like TSM had their own thing. It was like Game Cribs and then you had... What was the one that started like right after that like Zach Mazzotta ran? Uh, uh, the one from Machinima, I think. Yes, yeah. the CLG one, yeah. Yeah, and so I think that those trended orgs into wanting to do things like that. Um, I think part of why TSM, you know, minus the whole winning and that they were likable, I think part of why they captured so many fans in the beginning was they had like a lifestyle reality, like behind the scenes, sometimes like very behind the scenes actually, sure. of like what happened. And so me personally like not hiding anything i was super inspired by that like i saw that as something that allowed me i was never a tsm fan per se like i was never connected okay. to that um but i liked the opportunity that it gave for an org or like a entity or group of people um actually super random side note i'm more upset that like offline tv doesn't have something like that 
but now back on track. Um, right, I see. Yeah, it is bizarre. I agree with you. <laughs> Be the most obvious thing to do would be have an edited show each week that gets the best of the shit they're doing and follows the narrative. That you think you're right on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So sorry, back on track. Uh, and so like Sully, who actually ran uh, that show, I think pretty much by himself. Game uh, Crips, yeah, Crips. He did. yeah. I actually used to he, work with him at Give so I can give you some insight into that afterwards. But yeah. Yeah, like he, I, so I was working. Uh, I guess some like backstory in me. I was working for League PD at the time. I was literally just hitting record on the camera. Um, and I would like talk to Sully about like all the cool shit that he got to do, like follow a team and be embedded and that stuff like really inspired me as like, wow, this is super cool. Like what this is presumably when you're in like the, the press room at the LCS or something. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Press room LCS, I think like season three. Right. So I'm like doing these post game interviews, like hitting record, you know, like the guy that was interviewing, uh, for Leaguepedia was like basically going up against Travis and there was this weird rivalry or whatever. <laughs> um, but like I wasn't into that. I was more into like what Sully was doing. And so like I kind of aspired to do that. And so when I essentially transitioned over to Azubu, that was like one of the things that I pitched, not super original, but I was like, hey, I think this could be cool. I did this like four part series called Roads for Curse. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how I got to know everyone at Curse. Uh, and that's ultimately kind of how I got the gig. Uh, okay. that curse transition into TL. And so um, a lot of that was like when LCS became, uh, for me at least, like real, like it was, I think it transitioned out into a new studio and it felt like a little more scheduled and regimen. Uh, and like HTC had like signed up for us. So there was like justification for me. Like we had to do these deliverables and I like totally overshot it. And I was like, oh, I'll do this weekly show. Or maybe it's bi-weekly, or it's like as soon as we could get it done, as often as we could get it done. And it was like really, like really honestly, like very unhealthy at like pretty much like TSM and and Liquid just went at it, like in terms of like how to up production value and how to raise a bar. And so for that whole year, I think it was just kind of us doing it on like a real commitment. And then after that, it was like every org had to have it. Like the next year, like 50%, and then the year after that, it was like 70% of the league all had a show. And so okay. it like really spiraled. So now I feel like it's expected and teams are trying to figure out how to be different. Okay. And that's I, very I, we'll, we'll go into some of the specific shows, yeah. like some of the famous ones and some instances, mm-hmm. but to keep it on the abstract aspect, like local, what do you think of this? You were someone who was in a team yeah. and obviously had a reality series and some of the things he's talking about there, mm-hmm. like I would agree with him. I think Games Cribs did a lot also to boost TSM's like popularity. Like famously, if you remember, it's funny that everyone sort of it bizarrely reviles Chaos now because actually he got if anything too much sympathy for how he was portrayed in the game cribs where it seemed really sad when he was fired because obviously they couldn't show all the fucked up shit he did yeah. so it just made it seem like he's a lovely guy who just got fired over an argument so i would say that actually from the first show onwards take graham cribs on it was clear that like it, while it's good for the team it's maybe not always good for certain players and there's clearly negatives come with the positives right so what do you think of it as a as a concept doing like a reality show or having a team make their own content what do you okay. think okay i'll answer both or answer that question but before that i want to kind of touch on the tsm stuff that damien mentioned so tsm getting popular with game cribs and also i think a huge part is tsm used to vlog a lot do you guys remember when they were way back sure. in like new york um they would vlog all the time like rolling in the garage or like some of them by the way are wild like like i'm not exaggerating there are all those vlogs are still on the internet and there is one where i'm not even joking it's reginald and i think chaos literally calling m5 a certain what people would now call gay slur that begins with f i'm not even joking it's still on the internet now like that video is still up it's wild like these were different times back then boys so yeah they were just going raw as fuck yeah there was no production value put out with it so when I joined the team, um, Andy had me do vlogs and Andy had like a requirement that all the players do one vlog a week or at the very least one vlog every two weeks. And then I kind of didn't understand, but Andy told me like it's a huge core of like TSN value to be able to connect with the fans and get back and make sure they feel like you're their friends and they can watch you and build like a connection with you. So they definitely know that doing the vlogs and showing an inside look was a huge part of building the fan base. And it was something that was very deliberate it wasn't accidental at all like they continue doing content and they continue to do um legends or yeah tsm legends because it's such a big part of cultivating a fan base and i think other orcs saw success in that and that's why they're following suit like hey if you don't do this kind of stuff we're just like 
five dudes like playing video games, especially when you have Koreans on the team, um, because yes. you can't tell a story about the players themselves. And you, if you don't develop an emotional connection, then you, you're, you're not going to care that much about League of Legends or professional League of Legends or about the team well, in general. Let's actually then, before we touch on the other part, let's talk about that as a topic then, because one thing you just touched on there, it's interesting that you actually went with the Korean example, because that was something I was going to actually use as an example myself. You know, in the past of esports, when mainstream people first came in and did like, you know, if like CNN or something did like a report about esports and they follow someone around who's a pro player and they interview him and his mom, whenever they're making the story, it used to be really famous in the early days of esports, even up to about like two or three years ago, that they would always make the storyline almost like fake like they would like make the storyline way sexier than it was like you know like this player battled all this adversity or they'd try and like build some weird thing is like they'd pick a player who was also in the league and make him his rival even if he wasn't really his rival you know mm -hmm. and the reason they were doing this local is because they all thought like i don't know if you know this but a lot of people before they knew what esports was if you ever you told them oh I'm, like i'm into professional gaming they thought it meant that like it was like, you know, like the World Series of Poker main event. The whole point is loads of the players there aren't pro poker players. They're just random people who have the money in the enter because they want to see if they can win. Yeah. They used to think that's what gaming was like. So they thought when I go to a tournament, even if I interview a pro, he's just like one of the better random people who play this tournament. Mm -hmm. And so they used to condescendingly think he probably doesn't have an interesting backstory. Like he's probably just a dude sat at a PC. Mm -hmm. But what actually is so insane is that that's just because they don't know who that person is. Every single player who's an LCS player, if you have the skill for how to tell a narrative, has a really good narrative story about their life. Mm -hmm. Like the reason I the reason I think it's it was good that you mentioned the Korean aspect is because I know the same experience. When I first started watching StarCraft Brood War when it was on in Korea, I think I started watching it at the end of 2009. So this was still when it was a big thing, you know, before StarCraft II. I used to first watch, and first of all, because I didn't know any Korean people, like there was nobody even in CS almost that was Korean, you know. First of all, I had the same problem a lot of people have, which is I couldn't tell the difference between a lot of the players. Mm -hmm. Like I actually legitimately would see, go on the street when I first came to Korea shortly after that. And I remember, no joke, thinking I saw like Jadong on the street or somewhere. And I now know, obviously, it's just a guy who looked vaguely like Jadong. Mm -hmm. And in my brain, I'd forgotten it enough that I was like, oh, my, the fuck is that Jadong? But then I realized, like, I think I saw him again like another day. I was like, it definitely is. And it is it like, so my point is, like, first of all, I couldn't tell the difference. And then even worse, because they show you even less of the personality of the players there, they just go and sit in a booth and play. And then they all give the same boring interview. Yes, I will give good games if you cheer for me, you know, like they had no personality. And that's where that meme in StarCraft came from, like the faceless Korean. And that's why everyone claimed, you know, no one wants to watch Koreans. But when I became a fan, I obviously started reading interviews and started reading all the fan posts where they have all the little trivia. And what you actually find is, even in Korea, where the players are literally just sat at a PC for 14 hours a day and they have no real life, when you know even the narrative of that guy's career, like, oh, you know, when he came up, he was a rookie and people said he'd never make it, but then he actually, like, changed his stuff. Like, the narrative becomes amazing when you actually know the details. So mm -hmm. I actually do think, I agree with you, like, for Koreans especially, if you're an orc who's brought in some Korean that no one knows except for his player, make him, like, a key element of your... Uh, doc, like documentary and I guarantee he will get really popular in the West mm -hmm. like if Sunday was in a really good one theirs is okay the 100 Thieves one but if he'd have been in like a really good one I think he would be one of the most popular players in the league yeah I mean that's why Lust Boy was so popular because Lust Boy kind of had his own story a lot like kind of linked with me like I brought Lust Boy over from my old team and he did like the whole John Cena thing he was very meme -y. he liked Cass he used Twitter really well he was a really good player like he just had a really good brand that was easy to tell a story around and in combination with TSM Legends where you did get to see Lust Boy interact with coaches and players like yeah I think super important to tell stories of Korean players if you think of Korean players that you know very well of their stories they're players on TSM and Team Liquid so it's players like Piglet, Phoenix, you know them very well because TL sure. told their stories. If you think of Korean players on, I mean, obviously T TSM, I just talked about Lost Boy. But yeah, these are the examples of players you know so much about because their orgs did a great job of telling their story. I want to flex a little bit and say the storytelling that we did behind the Ole last year was insane in comparison to like what Immortals did for him the previous year. Hmm. Like, I, I don't know. I feel like after... I think it takes effort too, right? It's like takes a production team to want to tell and get to know these people mm -hmm. and not just like check in and check out like, hey, I'm shooting this thing. Okay, I'm done. Like the relationship that I built with Piglet like took time. Like in the beginning, he was very much like, I don't give a shit about like doing this interview. Like, can we get it over with? Um, and then like the more that we went out to like team dinners and like, you know, hanging out and like having drinks with them occasionally, it was like we became 
more friends, like definitely work friends. Like we weren't just going shopping together or anything, mm -hmm. but it definitely was like a bond. And so like after we broke that initial barrier of like, hey, we're just here to work together. Mm -hmm. Like every time I would interview him, it was like so rich because he's like such a shit talker, right? And he's super confident. Mm -hmm. Like all that started to break through, like after we crack like the first layer of like, hey, I'm not just here to like record you and then paste it into a timeline and export, like, like work with me to like tell a narrative. So like a That's, lot of the stuff, yeah, yeah, a lot of the stuff that. that you saw in the first couple episodes of Rebirth wasn't just like, Hey, uh, we recorded benching you like good luck on the perception. Like he very much, I think had a certain perspective on what was going on and it wasn't just like something that came out of nowhere. I think there was like some trust that was part of that. Because the funny thing is, right, this is a perfect example of an area where I'm pretty sure <clears throat> a lot of very naive fans would think, oh, well, the reason why, like, all these shows are made the way they are now is because esports is still small. But, you know, one day it won't be like Damien Estrada. It'll be, you know, HBO or it'll be some, like, ESPN, and they'll be doing, like, the full all-access one. I'm going to go ahead and tell you now. It may be true that if those big orgs get involved one day, they might have their own content, and it might be very good, like they have in boxing and MMA and all the all the other sports. NHL's a particular good one if you've ever watched the road to the winter cup etc but i would say winter classic rather but i would say this like i would think this particular area you will never get better people than the people who are in esports because what my point there was you can't put a fake narrative over the person it won't be as cool you have to know the person and you have to know their career and so you actually you have to be from esports to do that really well even though to an outsider they think it's just shoot a camera and be really good at editing you know yeah no i totally agree uh, not to sidetrack, but what did you guys think of the Seven Days Out uh, series? I've um, never seen it, so you can oh, go ahead really? and tell me. What is that? Um, so, wait, that, that I didn't make that. That was a Netflix thing. Okay. Uh, so, Seven Days Out, or Netflix, has a show called Seven Days Out that was made that followed. Um, we were, like, one of seven, like, the LCS finals from spring, right? What's the first split? Is that spring? Yeah, spring. Yeah. Um, and it followed 100 Thieves, right. uh, TL, and Echo Fox. And uh, they, like, actually have... They got so lucky with those three if they picked those three as yeah. well. Those so are the they... top three in that split. <laughs> right. And so I think the Echo Fox thing was a little felt like um, putting the lens of, like, a traditional news thing of, like, hey, this is Rick Fox. They're on a jet. Yeah. Ha ha. Like, this is cool. Um, but, like, Hooney definitely gave them personality, and Rick Fox is actually really good and genuine on camera. Um, and the 100 Thieves thing, they definitely, like, played into, like, you know, Nade Shot's all about this fashion thing, and his team's kind of like, I don't really care. I'm already so, getting some warning signs that they're just focusing on the owners as, like, one of the main characters. But, right. okay, keep going. So, for us, it was definitely more focused on Peter, but obviously, like, we all know what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, like, they were, like, don't take the word luck in this regard in a wrong way, but they were like lucky enough to capture the actual phone call that Peter got oh, like wow. when he found out in like genuine, like, I don't think he knew that he was labbed and it was like a whole thing. And it sounds like really trashy when you talk about it, but the way that they did it was like actually like really respectful and uh, mm -hmm. was like a little emotional. Like when I was watching it at Riot, when they first premiered it, like I was crying in the theater because like I've known Peter for a long time. And, like, I had met his family, so it was, like, very much a, like, holy shit, I had never seen that, like, from the actual outsider perspective. And so that is one of the few moments, but it might be very specific to that event that I felt like this was an actual, like, genuine representation of how that time period felt. Anyways, um, yeah, as you said, like, when you're saying lucky, it's not, like... Oh, they, they're lucky they got, what is it, this happened. It's like, luck, they're lucky that they were able to capture that shot. And I do think, like, that storyline and that split itself was such a good storyline for Doublelift. Like, getting kicked from TSM, getting kicked from his second big org to join the Forever Fourth org and going through, like, a really big tragedy. And so, uh, That like, was the summer, technically, but yeah, for the year, I agree, yeah. Yeah, and, like, overcoming it and, like, making big shit happen. It was an incredible storyline, so... And I think that helps esports a lot, like people getting to see incredible storylines like that. Okay. I was watching like, this. What, what, wait, wait yeah. there's one thing I do want to say. So I don't follow other esports that closely um, other than League. Like I'm, I'm very League, like 90%, 80% of my life is League of Legends. And I was watching this video called Top 10 Anime Betrayals in League of Legends. And they were talking about 
I thought it would be majority league, but it wasn't. There was like really big Dota storylines, like No Tail and Fly. I think was number yes. one when they won yeah. international. And I was like, holy shit, the storyline's so fucking cool. This yeah, is like course. legit yeah. anime. Like, like that's what I'm talking about. If you actually do the storylines right, you don't need to know the game. Like, you do know Dota, but like, I, you, I'm sure you can agree. If someone's only ever watched like CS:GO or League, they've never watched Dota. Ever, they don't need to watch it to know that storyline, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just super incredible. Where I just think of League of Legends like storylines. Uh, they're not really storylines. They're just things that happen in my life, my friend's life, and I just take it as is. And I'm too into it to be really separated from it. But when I hear like the Dota storyline, it's like, holy shit, this is cool. And I realize, oh, this is probably what people that aren't closely tied to esports think about League of Legends storylines, like when they are able to experience it from a third person point of view. We'll put it this way. One thing that me and Richard Lewis are both on the same page for, because he's always said this as well, is like one of the main things that I would love to do in esports, like I wish it'd get to this level, is anyone who's a sports fan knows that ESPN series, uh, 30 for 30, where it's like a mini documentary and you pick like one key topic. So like you pick like a famous team that was like very outrageous or you pick some incident where someone like blew their whole career on a missed shot or something. Mm -hmm. And you do, what you do is years later, you go back and you get all those people together and you do the documentary where you get the classic footage and you have them talking over, oh yeah, you know, we knew we'd lost the game when he did this. Like imagine that for esports, that'd be mm -hmm. so sick. Oh, With the right people, don't tell them the story. Come on, Daniel. I actually, I tried a, a little, a mini version of that um, last year where we, the Madison Square Gardens, or sorry, yeah, MSG, that was New York, right? Um, yeah. Win of CLG. And so it was like, we had an interview with who Gabe, who used to work at 1UP Studios. He got an interview with Afro. So we had like Afro's perspective of that event. Um, we did like an interview with uh, Darshan, but like, just technical errors, so it, it didn't pan out. But because we had three of the five, right? We had Poe Belter, Double, X Smithy. And so we did kind of go back on the week that I think we played against CLG um, to kind of like revisit that. So definitely not like the production level or like that many years later, but it's it was so interesting to hear like, uh, you kind of get in this monotony of like, how do you feel about playing FlyQuest next week? How do you, and it's like double it's like, yeah, we're going to crush him. Okay, what's next? How do you feel about playing, you know, Golden Guardians? And he's like, oh, we're going to crush him, but then we lose. Um, and so it's like, you get into this like rinse and repeat. And he was so excited to talk about the past. Mm -hmm. Like he was so ready. Like he like had super, like uh, there was just so much stuff that we couldn't use because he got super detailed. Like, oh yeah, the dinner the night before and blah, blah, blah. And I remember Rick Fox coming and talking to us. And mm -hmm. so like I had pulled some stuff from content that Riot had made to like attach to that stuff. And then it transitions like Afro talking about it. And so I've tried to do stuff like that, but I agree with you. Like it'll be great when there's the day that like you get a full Whoa. big budget. I'm surprised that you haven't referenced this already. But if anything, didn't you already do that? Like Breaking Point basically was kind of like a 30 for 30. It was like we went back. Admittedly, it was quite soon after. It wasn't like 30 years later or whatever. Right. We went back. Also, one of the things people forget about that documentary <laughs> is for people who don't know, when I'm in that documentary over and over again, right, I only did like one interview. It was maybe like an hour long on, on Skype. Someone recorded it. And I didn't know they were going to use it that way. I thought maybe some of it was even just for background or something, you know, like just to see what was going on. But actually the way they used it basically was like a makeshift version of what I'm talking about. I was kind of the talking head setting up the like the, the context of what happened and then they'd show the footage. So I actually thought, for example, one of the best parts of that was early on when you managed to get that part where I basically said like, if you bench Dardock, but then you lose the game and he has to come right back in, you basically just told him, like, you're the most valuable player on my team. You can do whatever you want. And because they, because he looped that with, like, the narrative and it's timed properly, it tells that story perfectly. So if anything, you've already kind of had a crack at it. You just obviously, there's not the budget of a fucking 30 for 30. Very true. Very true. Yeah, that... Go for it, Loco. Uh, I mean, I, I was just going to say, TL loves using your voice. Um, In their, like, most recent, uh, like, TL... Today? What is it? Like, they came out with, like, a hype for this season and I was listening to it and then I randomly started hearing your voice when it got to like the Jensen double lift part. I was like, oh my God, Doran's voice again. Like I have to hear this idiot again. Listen, listen, I am literally the esports historian, homie. That's a real thing. I know I'm not doing it like while I'm talking now, but yeah. people don't realize. <laughs> That is what one day will probably be my main role. I'll just be the fucking talking head that says like esports story, and I'll be like, of course, back in 2015, Lauka was washed up by that. Like, you know, like to basically, basically a more serious version of what I do here, but less swearing. You're such, yeah. you're so biased, though. How how can you tell a 
legitimate story from multiple points of views because you have very strong opinions and like I do think you are a good historian in the fact that you remember a lot of things and you've been involved with a lot of things, but you have your own very, very strong opinion. I love this. Go ahead. Go on. Do the classic move everyone does to me in my other job, which is journalist. Well, what they do is people who don't know anything about journalism explain to me what a journalist does, someone who's been a lifelong journalist. So what you just did there, Loco, mm -hmm. is you, you said something about historians, mm -hmm. but you don't actually know what historians do. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think historians just take facts and list them in order? So they say, right, uh, World War II began on 1939 on this day, and these people went to, no, no, what happens is every single sentence almost mm -hmm. contains some form of editorialization. Because mm -hmm. the actual job of the historian is, he's not just listing the facts, otherwise you'd be the historian reading the book. Mm -hmm. He goes and reads the facts for you, and then he tries to explain to you the context of what was happening. Mm -hmm. Like, well, the reason why it was interesting that Germany ended up going to war was because, you know, they'd actually been limited in their war supplies by the Treaty of Versailles, and so this was a knock-on that caused populism to go. Like, all of that's editorialization you know like a lot of that was opinion the idea is this law this is the thing that people don't understand to be a very good journalist or historian mm -hmm. you should be biased because you should be a biased in favor of what you think the most important criteria is mm -hmm. like you know the actual term objective is nearly always used wrong people think objective means you just show all sides to a story and let people decide no 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 objective means you think there is an objective truth and you are going to try to get to that truth no matter what so even if that truth comes out meaning that this person's a monster and terrible piece of shit that's objectivity mm -hmm. okay I was, well, I was educated. Thank you, Thorin. Yes, don't worry about it. That was actually yeah. kind of the approach that we took with Breaking Point, is oh, that we didn't want to, like, trend in a... Because at the point, at, at that moment in time, right, I would have just trended, like, at least 30 more minutes of bad look clips. <laughs> but we shaved it off so that he had a fair fight. You oh, had to make him look good. No. You know, yeah. people don't know. If you, if you know how bad Loco really was, like, they actually made him look very favorable. Wow. Day, <laughs> so. I know. Well, well, I mean, I guess breaking point is a good thing. <laughs> That's his trigger point. So let's go. Let's go. Let's talk about um, <laughs> without getting too much into like management parts, like just me and like the video team. I mean, me and Damien are both. I would say we're friends now. Like we're I yeah, mean, when, when, when yeah. we see each you other, like we'll say hi, like we'll chill. Like I yeah. I'll give you I mean, were you hella salty at him after you got fired from Team Liquid? No. <laughs> what is it, Damien? Just straight up, the people that were really involved on Breaking Point, Damien and Michael Artris, at the time when I was on TL, we did not get along. Me, Damien, and Artris. So I still think Breaking Point is a very unfair point of view. And for multiple reasons, like the production team didn't like me for, I mean, reasons outside of or just... We don't have to go into the nitty gritty. You were having boba tea with all my girlfriends. Yeah, we understand. Keep going. Oh my God. What is it? We don't have to go into... <laughs> <laughs> don't laugh it makes people fucking think it's true don't laugh okay oh my god oh that face <laughs> damien i hate you um so anyways um it's yeah, just and... funny you know sorry <laughs> me and the production team didn't get along and also from management's perspective they were either gonna stay with dardock or they were gonna sell dardock and they have no reason to defame Dardock or Piglet because I do think those were the other two troublesome parts on the team. And they want to make sure value of these players stays high as possible. So I do think, like, from their perspective, we don't want to make Dardock look bad. We don't want to make Piglet look bad as possible. But coaches, right, for one, they weren't staying with me for next split. And two, you can't sell coach contracts. Like, coach contracts in esports don't sell. Sure. So what happens to my value does not matter at all to TL. So I think Breaking Point was a very biased point of view and an unfair telling of things that happen. But I mean, that's my point of view and that's my reasoning. Thing is though, like the problem is local, when you're making a documentary like this, like mm -hmm. for example, for people who've never made a documentary, one of the things that is most misunderstood is y the amount of hours that you film for how much you actually get at the end. Like that's why I've been, put it this way, in the early days of esports, I've been in loads of documentaries, mate, for like 30 seconds, you know, I'll go and do an hour interview and then they would feature me going like, yeah, and that was when Fatality was on top. And like, that'll be, that's it, you're in. And you're like, what the, where the fuck's the rest? But the point is when this guy's got this massive story to tell, mm -hmm. People have to get caught, you know? Mm -hmm. So in this particular scenario, like you can't tell a whole season story. So like, here's the problem. Even though you're right, there might have been like something that happened after a scene that they cut out that made it look better. <laughs> the problem is like their job isn't make local look as good as possible and be totally mm -hmm. as fair as possible. Their job is tell a story. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, if that doesn't work for the story and it would just be boring, even if for you it would be necessary, it's mm-hmm. going to hit the cut room floor, mate. You have to make those hard choices, you know. And then the other aspect is, even though I get from your perspective, I totally get why if you feel like certain things weren't shown mm-hmm. and that they emphasize some things too much is bad. But believe it or not, <coughs> jokes aside, I actually think of those three people, you came out looking the best mm-hmm. because here's why. Dardock, I think, came out looking fucking terrible because I don't care. They did the thing in the Dardock part where it doesn't matter that they try and have parts towards the end. Like, yeah, you know, I'm trying to improve and that's like, it doesn't matter. His, his behavior has been so bad mm-hmm. that anyone who watches that just thinks, fuck this guy. I would never want to play with him. Piglet sort of gets a break because they keep showing all that stupid ass footage where he's like a fucking seven year old kid. Like, I don't want to get out of bed. Like, Roland, like, what even is this? Is this an, an adult human being? What are you doing? Like, now that, that moment actually made me realize, have an epiphany that like a lot of Koreans are like emotionally stunted because they're just playing video games from the time they were 12 and they didn't learn how to be like a social human. But that's a side topic there. So anyway, Piglet looks terrible. He looks really bad. Wait, can you I, look can bad I... in moments, but here's the thing that you probably don't think of yeah. is I actually think the drama of Piglet and Dardock helps you because if people don't know that, they actually will be more thinking you're a shit coach. Whereas actually me knowing that that happened makes me actually give you more of a pass for what happened with Team because I don't think anyone could have controlled those two players. Okay, so for like the Piglet part, on um, Piglet like being like a baby, so sometimes I'm like that too and it comes from having like a really close relationship with your mom in Korea. Like Korean okay. moms are like overly doting a lot of times and I know Piglet has a really close relationship with, with his mom and it's something common I saw with my other friends that have like a really close relationship with their mom like they dote on them a lot so we like they you know what, like childish no call cool. I'll say this joke because it's a funny joke but I will put the caveat that like I actually don't know you well enough as a person so I would never really say this I'm only saying it with this disclaimer so you okay. don't get offended my joke there the obvious joke would be like that doesn't make any sense at all local because I have a great relationship with your mom and she didn't we never do that like you know like that would be the obvious joke on it that's why I, I did set it up so it wasn't that offensive that's the fact, you know like whatever I set it up to be reasonable okay. didn't I somewhat you know I Doran between you and me make all the fucking jokes you want I think it's good for the okay. show and I know you're enough of an asshole and like that's just your own personal sense of humor like I stopped treating you like an equal human being and I'm just like okay this guy is like he was dropped when he was younger he probably wasn't yes. loved as a child and yeah. I'm just gonna take it for what it is and I'm just gonna love him the way I want to love him because he shows love by being on my show and helping me with my show so I'm gonna show love for him okay. or where he's like a little bit socially inept yeah. or just like I want to shoot him like it's just Doran being Doran. The sad thing is, though, actually, that's one of the few areas when you, like, meet people's mothers where, actually, I never do any edgy banter at all. I actually, that's the mad thing. Wait, you called out eSports moms. You said eSports yeah. moms. Come at me. I On was... the show, I said if they come publicly at me, I'll wreck them. In private, I am always really nice to people's parents because, like, you know, like, they're from an older generation stuff. So the actual irony is a lot of people, when they're, like, are so worried if their, like, mom comes to an event and, like, I'll give you an example, actually, you from Team Liquid. Mm-hmm. So, uh... I think it was Twist's mom came to ESL New York. Am I thinking the right person here? Yeah, I think so. I think it was Twist's, right? And he was still a very young player at the time. And, I, and I, um, I took a picture with her, right? And then you should have seen how scared Team Liquid, like, org people were. They were like, please don't tweet that with a horrible joker. Please, please, this is more than... I was like, I would never do that anywhere. Like, the, what I like to do instead is go the other way. What I do is I'm really nice to the mothers. And then they're like, oh, that Thorin's a really great guy. And they're like, no, he's not. You don't understand. And they're like, oh, he was. Like, listen, I have, I'm, listen, I'm older than you. I'm a good judge of character. He's just an upstanding guy. You know, but he gets a bad rep. It's like, that's how I, I get in there. But anyway, what did you think back on the, the breaking point aspect? Uh, yeah, I actually want to talk about um, kind of like the three-way tie, right? Like mm-hmm. Loco versus Starduck versus Piglet. Mm-hmm. Um, there were... So uh, in Loco's defense, Loco did a lot of like one-on-ones that we didn't shoot. So a lot of the positive things that he was probably doing, we just like didn't have on camera, right? Okay. So like if he's doing a one-on-one, like working with like Dardock or Piglet or Matt with something, like majority of that stuff we never filmed. And so it was like, we didn't even have necessarily an opportunity outside of being like, all right, Loco, so what good did you do today, (laughs) right? And it's like, no one wants to see him sit there and talk about like how he helped Phoenix solve this problem that he couldn't get over, right? Mm -hmm. So it was like hard to represent you positively in that regard. Um, And like a lot of the stuff that we shot was, you know, probably you getting upset about stuff. Keyboard break, (laughs) infamous keyboard break gif. The thing is, um, though, the keyboard break had to be in there. Come on. You can't cut that footage. I, so specifically, after that keyboard break happened, um, I talked to Mike. I think I've 
don't exactly recall Mike's role at the time. I know he's COO now of Team Liquid. I'm not, but he was doing like a similar role. I talked to Mike. I was like, what is it? You told me, what is it, to be myself as possible and don't worry about the cameras. And you told me if there's clips I absolutely do not want on the show, we won't, we'll not put it on the show. So at a certain point, like, cause I wasn't getting a lot of material and I said, okay, we would talk from the cameras and then after the cameras are done, I would talk about more personal stuff with the players or things I really want to say that was kind of off camera. And then Mike caught on to that and Mike told me to stop doing that. He told me I will have a choice on what if it, if you don't want something to be shown, like we will make sure we don't show it. So I operated under that and I started being just, I guess, more, I don't want to say more real. It's just certain parts of like conversation within a team or how a team operates, you don't show on camera. And I made sure to not show any of that. And after that conversation, I felt like, I guess, safe enough to just do like live my life, like without like having to worry, or is this going to be on cam? Is this going to be on cam? And after that keyboard scene happened, I talked specifically to Mike to tell him, Hey, make sure this doesn't end up. And he said, yes. And of course it fucking ended up in the TV. Good whoa, guy. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. It was from a split previous, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't in the present day. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the truth that I'll let out is that mm -hmm. I don't think anyone knew that that was in the final cut. I slipped that in. Okay. For you. <laughs> My life, right? Well, so if there are any players listening, mm -hmm. don't trust any of these snakes. They'll all just straight turn on you the second they can. Because here's the thing. They are from the media. Like when he said earlier, like, oh, obviously I don't mean lucky. Like mm -hmm. I can tell you, if you know any like mainstream news people, that's how they talk about stuff. Like, oh, you wouldn't believe how lucky I was. I got there right when the guy's head came off out of the ambulance yes. and like all the blood was everything. They're loving that. Like that's what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about like people who are like ambulance chasers, you know, like, you know, like the movie Nightcrawler. That's literally what the people in the media are like. They would actually say that for real, though. So they'd be like, oh, I was loving it. Yeah, you wouldn't believe we got all the murder and everything. They're, they're outrageous for that sort of shit. Mm. So where you keep doing that face, so now people who are watching the show think that I'm talking about Double Lift, even though I was quite clearly referencing a fucking movie where I, a guy who isn't Double Lift wasn't doing any of that. I, I just did that face because you talked about gore. Why are you in You're like a fucking dog. <laughs> I can read your mind, mate. Yeah, I know you oh want to go out in a minute, but if you get, go get your fucking bored. No, you, you're talking out, about I'm gore, busy. so I was like, mm, you're talking about gore. Oh my okay, God. right, fair enough. Okay, I didn't wow. realize he was sensitive to blood logo. I should have probably because, I mean, uh, like... I'm just, at this point, I'm just waiting for you to announce what fucking gender you actually are at this point in time, but wow. whatever, homie, you just, you do you, you do you. <sighs> I'm sorry. Back on track, breaking point. Anyway, here's the thing, Damien, maybe one day, if, if that, here's the thing, I've got a great project for you. One I'm day, me and, me and Loco's show gets so big, like we've got such sponsorship and backing, we're even doing it in a live studio. Yeah. We bring you in to do the real behind the scenes because people are always going to wonder, you know, Love what it. is our relationship like? Yeah. And obviously, the second the camera's on, again, Loco, like, no, I've got to be real, haven't I? Starts throwing tantrums, fucking being bratty, like, mm, probably just doing stuff like, mm hmm, girlfriend, like, probably just over <laughs> like, a fucking family guy character. I better be amazing. I'll just be sat there like a punk. I'll tell you right now what persona I'm going to assume with this because I'm going to act the whole time of the video. I'm not going to be myself. I'm yeah, going to be yeah. sort of like the tired old British rock and roller, like, yeah, fuck yeah, whatever. And then just like, you can even film fake scenes of me using drugs and stuff if you want to make like, you know, the more tragic the storyline. So yeah, I'm yeah. telling you one day, keep it in, in your back pocket. That's That project's green lit. I'm giving you a green light on that one already. In fact, if you're ever around Loco, feel free to just whip out your phone and start filming some, you know, some gonzo footage. Use it in the show later again. Just edit it in. I'm ready. Breaking point two. Um, dude, you know, like me and Josh are pretty good friends nowadays. Like you should do like a piece, like me, Josh and Piglet. Like I actually think it'd be hilarious. Like talking, like kind of like 30 for 30 and like talking about breaking point. Like maybe like, I guess like editor, not, not what is it? Or director's <laughs> edition with like commentary where me, yeah. I'll give you, you, Piglet and Dardog yeah. all watch breaking point and we talk about like the scenes and stuff. I actually, uh, that, would be, that would three, be good. Three year anniversary. Life. Yeah, hella down. Like, I, I do think the director's commentary one is a good angle, but another good angle you could actually take it, this is a real good content idea, actually, is in the NBA last year, they did a couple of interviews where they got people who had had beef to do sit-down interviews years later. So they had Magic Johnson and Isaiah Thomas, who famously used to be friends and then had, like, a really big beef. And then they had Kobe Bryant and Shaq. And the whole point is, it was just the two of them interviewing each other. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing is, because it's so, oh, so intimate, like you're literally, it's no interview with you. Mm -hmm. It means that when you then ask the person the question is, but the key thing is it has to be like it would work with Dardo because it's enough years later it has to be enough years later that the guy can really like actually talk about what he was thinking then and be like yeah I was you know but right then or I was a bit toxic to you but you know what maybe I, you know I didn't respect your authority or whatever whatever angle they take that would actually be really sick I'd like to see that mm -hmm. 
Then again, though, Dardock would have to actually fucking turn up for interviews he does to do that, wouldn't he? You little fucking snake. <laughs> don't, don't hate on Josh so much. He, I, I bet you were, like, irresponsible and you flaked a lot when you were Absolutely 18. not. Absolutely not. No. Oh, when I was 18, I might yeah. have. But then again, I wasn't in esports, so it's irrelevant. I'm, we hold people... In, I, that's the funny thing about esports. We hold, like, all these 18, 17, 19, even early 20-year-olds to such high standards where they're just kids. Yeah, that sounds like a defense for yourself, but I know it does. I'm 26. He, he, when, whenever Loco talks about it, he's usually building in a, like a defense that you know might be used in a law, like because the way he doesn't want to do is the other way around. Like, yeah, they're all just brats like that, and then in one day, if, I, if I'm ever suing him, because that's another possibility I think about, then I'm like, <laughs> uh, I'd like to show evidence exhibit one one two, and then he's like, yeah, you know, just because you're 18 doesn't mean you're exempt from what you did. And I'm like, bring up the footage, just like. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, though, actually, if we yeah. go back to the breaking point angle, mm -hmm. uh, when you made that show, Damien, like, give me some insight, because I remember the story originally was, like, sold as, like, oh, you know, we were going to just film, like, a normal reality series as we normally did, but then just from the boot camp, we could see, like, it was, like, a complete shit show, basically, and it was going so badly that we were, like, you know, rather than do, like, a documentary, like, why don't we make it just a documentary about how it went badly? Like, what is some of that sexed up? Is that really what the narrative was? So, uh, I, I, I mean, I will try to remember as clearly as possible. Um, I could be wrong in, like, what some of the communication was with certain people, but I'm pretty positive that, like, in the Rebirth days, like, leading up to all that, like, the grind that it took to do that series... Uh, and I still don't understand how TSM does it with, like, one person, mm -hmm. was, like, massive. It was just, like, 12 to 16-hour days, like, regular, like, five days a week. Sometimes, like, we were there for, like, 36 to 40 hours just trying to crank out an episode the day before it was due. Um, part of that is because we tried to be, like, like leveling up, you know, like, the production quality, like, every month or so, like, trying to add some new element. Mm -hmm. Um and so it was partially our fault. We could have just checked the box and made like what we did week one over and over again, probably pretty easily. But we kind of forced ourselves to do more. And because of that, like a lot of everyone was just like super burnt out. We didn't necessarily have like all the staff that we needed to, nor did the show necessarily provide enough budget to warrant the staff that was needed for as much as we were putting into it. So we thought, uh, which could have been a terrible idea at the time, was that like, let's not edit anything. Let's just shoot everything, and then we'll make a movie at the end. Because no one's really done that. Like CLG did a thing, okay. and there was like an ESL thing, I think, around the. So if they'd have won, it could have actually been like a great yeah. documentary. So, <laughs> so I mean, we were hoping that it would be a championship documentary about like Piglet came. You know, you saw him get to America in in Breaking Point and or sorry, in Rebirth, and, like, you saw him, like, struggle there, and, like, now in this film, he's finally ascended to greatness. We've won the championship. We're going to Worlds. But that's not what happened at all. Mm -hmm. And, like, ultimately, we committed to a deliverable. And so this is actually the most frustrating thing for me as a content creator. Like, you have, you know, like, Twitch chat and Reddit that are like, haha, Team Liquid trying to make money off of anything, like, off of their loss, like, trying to sell their drama. It's like... One, like, yes, I guess you could say that we made money because it was a deliverable, but it's not like we were going to make uh, 20 eggs for this championship documentary and 4,000 for this drama. It was like we had to make something, period. And so we could have made like some like, oh, we didn't win. We'll get him next time for an hour and a half. But that's like not interesting, nor did it actually tell what happened that split. So we tried to be, you know, local will say maybe not, but we tried to be as honest as possible with that um and that's how breaking point happened okay i mean like i would have loved mm -hmm. if it was called like i literally i think the project file and a playlist that i had of music that i felt i wanted the the whole film to be was called champion <laughs> the playlist <laughs> was on that one yeah, yeah. The, the playlist <clears throat> wasn't called breaking point when i made it it's mm -hmm. literally in my spotify as champion mm -hmm. uh -huh. so well, gg I mean, Damien says honest as possible, and I think it's honest as possible, as Doran said, to a certain point of view and a certain story that wants to be told. I mean, from my point of view, I don't think the story is honest. I don't think the story is complete, but that's from my perspective sure. and from 
Damien's filming perspective, or even from maybe Dardock's perspective, Pigo's perspective. I mean, I, they probably won't say the story was that honest, but from someone's perspective, that they try to tell the best story they can about what they saw. So, I mean, I well, here's what's that. funny though, Lord Court, is like you might not know this, but aside from the uh, when I gave that example of how actually anyone who's telling a story whether it's a historian or like actual fiction author obviously is like editorializing and giving their opinions and being biased mm -hmm. because that's the way they do it aside from like the abstract concept of that just happens anywhere it's actually a famous thing in documentary filmmaking that they consciously do that like some of them really do pick a person and get, you're the hero and he's the villain and this is what their story arc is and some people do that like there's a very famous one you might have seen it's a documentary called King of Kong has anyone seen this one? Yeah. It's about the guy who's trying to break the record in Donkey Kong, the old video game. Mm -hmm. And this current guy holds the record and this evil bastard's trying to hold him down and stop him getting up. Do you want to know what's insane? If you ever go and look up the details, the entire story is fabricated. Like the person who they paint as the villain didn't even have the record at the time. Some of his interactions, they just cut out all the part where he's a reasonable person. They literally do stuff, Damien. Like there's a scene I remember where they say like, oh, look, when this guy who's the bad guy arrived, he's so aloof and arrogant. He didn't even go and say hello to this guy. They just didn't show him going and saying hello. They had it on film. Like the actual, like some people actually will, in a dishonest manner, make documentaries in this manner to, to just to hype up the story, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, to speak about Breaking Point kind of from a... Uh, I remember there's one night where we were sitting there um, and you guys tell me at any point if this is like too much detail or we're drifting too far. No, go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. We're sitting there one night and we're like really stuck on how to like work these story arcs. So at this moment in time, I think I was working specifically with Gabriel, who now does Heist for 100 Thieves. And so we were like really stuck in like what uh, what are the story arcs, right? And we know that like from rebirth like piglet is our champion character right he's our like hero um maybe like a little bit of like an anti-hero to some extent uh we have dardock who like on a personal level like gabriel and i were like good friends with dardock we had no hard feelings against him um but we like obviously understood that like some of the interactions that like you obviously see in the film are kind of like uh come on like this is a little much um and then Loco is just like Loco. So we were like, okay. So the way that, that we thought about it was like, uh, okay. I think Sorry, was, I've got you something for you. Keep going. I think it was like the Dark Knight, right? We were watching this video that right. broke down the different characters in the Dark Knight. And so okay. you have like this uh, kind of like chaotic, chaotic. No, no, you're not. Oh, you have this no, chaotic no. That's character. That's I assume. Yeah, yeah. Who was Dardock. So we like watched this like film breakdown of like how they used that character to like cause chaos but not necessarily be like the voice of evil and harvey dent or two-face was kind of like the voice of evil or like pure evil towards the end so I'm that was loco. Uh, you know, it has been said about you before local mainly in the then, youth and then piglet's kind of like you know batman in pajamas yeah of course it's not the hero we we deserve the need but you say you would deserve it whatever right mm -hmm. so no the sad thing about that is i've got i've got the analogy for you right here because local was immediately starting to bristle when he heard like about the characters and stuff i'll give you a better one i'll go full ls since we can't have ls on the show mm -hmm. local because obviously he's just not your biggest fan is he so <laughs> since he's not on the show anymore i'll be ls and i'll give you wait, wait, wait. anime that's, reference that's, that's not true that's not true ls what if it is ls and i do talk and what if it, we will have Fair on enough. The show eventually okay okay, go okay. i look forward to it like this is imagine breaking point but it's the tv show naruto okay. like obviously dardock Dard is young jam. naruto you know like he's this young guy obviously he's not quite socially attuned you know he's got a lot of skill a lot of talent but he can't quite harness it people are telling him like yo you'll never make it because you're too unruly and undisciplined you know he's trying he's trying to make it but he's fucking up he's getting too impulsive obviously someone like Piglet, the established champion, but who's very haughty, and he would be like uh, Neji Hyuga. He would be that character who's like just a natural genius, you know, and he considers himself better than other people. And if you're not in his class, like, get the fuck out my face. You're just not on my level. Obviously, in this scenario, Loco Sakura, because what? of his relationship with Naruto, where it's sort of like a Sundere type scenario, and he's trying not to do that, and obviously he wants to be accepted by Neji, the you know the Piglet type character. Is like, well, we were both elite Korean Eddie Carries, and then Piglet, Piglet's like, get the fuck away from me. You're nothing like me, and then you're American to me, and then like the whole thing is like that sort of dance, basically. So. Damn, I always beat myself. Oh, I always beat myself at Sasuke. Sasuke, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, He's always did. wanted to be yeah, Sasuke. Yeah. I, um, I'll, I'll I mean, he's just like you, isn't he? All the women really want him. He's very stoic, keeps his emotions inside, attains a high level of skill. Is someone who's determined to succeed no matter what. Actually, like, exiled, the true value exiled, of revenge. Exiled. Uh, you got the exile part. Yes, yeah. you, were, you were rejected, Loco. That, in that way, you are just okay. like Sasuke Chan. I yes. had, I had a snake as a pet. Okay. Anyways, I'll, enough of, yeah, enough about Donald. I'll, I'll, I'll tell, us, I'll tell you a ready. hilarious story regarding Breaking Point. Damien's actually oh, going to love this. The, the, the last thing that I want to say about yeah. the little like anecdotal Dark Knight thing that I said, it like the the roles don't exactly a hundred percent pan out. So mm -hmm. I don't think Loco is as sinister mm -hmm. as you know Two Face might have been, mm -hmm. or or as level headed. <laughs> wow. But okay, so. There was a girl I was seeing. It was like a year or two after Breaking Point, and she's not from the esport world. She's from she was she's going <laughs> all right. She, she's just yeah. going to UCLA, but because we hung out in K Town a lot, and she would sometimes hang out with my esport friends, I think one of them told her to watch Breaking Point, and after good friends <laughs> after she watched Breaking Point, she kept asking me weird ass questions. She she didn't I didn't know she watched Breaking Point, but she asked me if I had anger management issues and how I was how I was at work and stuff because generally with like girls I'm seeing I don't like to talk about esports and I think she watched TSM Legends after that and well I knew she watched TSM Legends after that because after that like she came clean and then she was like yeah like um well like you're just you're not I thought you're this way and then I saw um breaking point because one of your friends said you should watch this if you want to know local better and then I wanted to see more and then they recommended TSM Legends so I watched TSM Fair Legends enough. so she was telling me like you're like so different like what are like what are you actually like are you like that like are you angsty and god like I fucking hate like breaking point and TSM Legends sometimes because one they were from when I was younger and I guess a little bit more fiery and not as mature and it wasn't like sure. the best times of my life and Technically, all recorded footage is from when we're younger, but I agree with you. Yeah, it was it was a few years ago, I guess. So keep going. <laughs> but it's so public <laughs> that like a lot of people know me just from Breaking Point, know me just from Shazam sure. Legends, and yeah. even like IRL friends sometimes will go back, go and like watch that stuff, and they'll like ask about it. And I just wanna, uh, I think, in, in a lot of ways, it is like a fair stor storytelling device, but still like. Not other people. Other people don't have their like early twenties fucking like turned into a video, like a weekly series or like a movie, and like just post it on the internet. Ugh. Right. One question, just for trivia, before we move on and talk about something else. Uh, which LCS pro is she dating at the moment? <laughs> no one. <laughs> no, no. Why would she be? Uh, just, just a weird question. I don't know why I asked that. She's, Definitely she not has, a lot of that going around in the LCS. I, so, I, well, there are girls like that, but she's someone that's not in more than esports at all. She's someone I met through a friend of a friend from UCLA. Okay, fair enough. Right, what about this then? So to bring it a bit back around, right? First of all, when you said there, Damien, about how like the first one was like the TSM game cribs, obviously, I, like I alluded to before, because when I worked for On Gamers, the guy who filmed Game Cribs, and it was just like a one-man crew. He just had the camera and he went around and he filmed it all, and he even edited it all. That's why there was that joke where like the, he literally put in the credits like editor, like fucking producer thing. That's not just for a gag. He really did do all that shit. Like those actually are real yeah. credits. Like you, you actually have to put those credits to get those in like IMDb and shit. So <clears throat> when he when I was working on Gamers, remember this is like, I think I joined like end of 2013 and I was fired in like October 2014. So roughly a year. This was obviously during the period when I had all the TSM beef. So obviously I asked this guy stuff like, oh, what was it like, you know, doing the Game Cribs thing and whatnot. And like, normally, obviously I don't reveal private stuff, but I don't think this is stuff generally that he thinks is like a big deal to reveal. It's no secret shit. He basically told me that like, actually it was really hard to make that documentary because of what I said earlier, that when he was coming in, he didn't know any of the players and he didn't know like the narrative story of like TSM's career and what they've done and what this player did. So because he was just trying to get cool shit to happen on camera, he said he, he literally would be filming. And first of all, just as a detail for people who, who don't know this, technically Game Cribs wasn't made by TSM. It was actually made by, well, On Gamers didn't exist, but the, the site that was before On Gamers was basically GameSpot, which was a games review site. They just got us, what happened was, I believe it's when TSM got the Snapdragon sponsorship. Part of it, I think, went with making this documentary series. That's why it was presented by Snapdragon as well. TSM or whatever Snapdragon, yeah. So I think it was like a, it was like a, 
it was like it was like an outside production company. It was TSM, and then there was like a middleman between the two, basically. And he basically told me because it wasn't TSM's documentary, they didn't want you to record like all the big arguments and stuff. There's a few of them in there, but some of them they were like, "Look, this is prior. Like, we don't we don't want that on camera." And so he even used to say at the end of a lot of the episodes, he would have to get and he the, his guy in the TSM team was Odd One, right? Because he's one of the few people who actually was like willing to talk to Met Press. And anyone who knows the Odd One knows he's actually like a lot more intelligent than a lot of like average pro players in in league legends he's a, he's a guy who knows what he's talking about and so he would just get the odd one and he'd just say to him right i've got to fill like 10 minutes so you just need to tell me some shit that happened today and he was like what do you mean what are you filming it and he's like oh i was filming it but i need you to just be like so yeah today you know like we were starting out practicing and then like i'm gonna cut that in with that and literally he had to just like artificially manufacture half the shit like as people might think that story is just happening organically like some of it is obviously like take chaos getting fired and all that. yeah that happens but like when you're making a documentary damien like Breaking point might be different because you had so much footage and you had so many natural things happening. But it can also be tough to actually even make it interesting to some degree, right? Yeah, I mean, that's actually what happened uh, during, like, the relegation year. You would imagine that, like, a team that's in relegation, like, twice, that there'd be, like, a lot of interesting drama or conversations sure. or, like, character development. And it was just, like all the same all the time it was like we're trying to do better like actually we're really trying we're really working we're trying to be a team we're trying to be friends and it was just that all the time and there was like nothing and so like those episodes were like so boring because there was like nothing going on so it it is like such a weird and and it was like we were recovering from the breaking point of like well, we're not gonna like we can't fake anything because that'll look extra bad because then it'll make look like it'll make it look like anything that happened in breaking point was manufactured so it it's it's a tough area that i do think a lot of content creators have to deal with like i, I imagine think, tsm went through that what is your take because you didn't give your take on this on the angle where what local basically brought up there is like two points one is the idea of like how does someone behave when they know they're on camera because even if you know in the back of your head, like, okay, I'll, I'll not think about it. Like he, everyone's to some degree conscious of it, you know? And actually what's funny is obviously there's some people who would be very shy and would act less. There's some people I think will go the other way. Like yeah. actually, I think if you're in a bad mood and someone's filming you as well, you know, now they're filming you and you're even thinking, oh, now people are going to think I'm a fucking asshole. You're going to get even more pissed off. You're going to get more irate, you know? Yeah. So it can definitely go lots of ways and it can in its own way be unusual. But what do you think of that angle of trying to, because on the one hand, the dream world, let's be real, like I said before about the Amnes chases, the dream world for you, right, is breaking point happens. They have all these fights, all these arguments. Maybe they even say, like, I'm going to fucking kill you. And at the end, none of them come to you and say, I want this removed. They're all just like, they don't say anything. It's just up to you yeah. what you tell us. That really is kind of the dream. But at the same time, when you know the people, because remember, you're not an independent company entirely. This is when you're with Team Liquid. At the same time, as a person who knows that guy and is going to work with him, you don't want to entirely put everything out there. You're trying to protect him a little bit. So there must be a challenge in doing that. Yeah, I think so. Um, I I think the way the content was made back then, as opposed to kind of how it is now, at least for us specifically, like you would have content creators that lived with the team for the most part. So like I live with the team for probably like a good year or I live like on site for a portion of it. And so you capture a lot more. I think now that we have a training facility, like people aren't necessarily like popping off. Not that that really happens with our team at all. But, like, that kind of stuff doesn't happen uh, very much. But I imagine at, like, uh, you know, maybe, like, TSM might still experience some of that stuff where it's, like, you do have to filter it. Um, and for me, I think it was a lot of, like, trying to not play favorites. Like, I really liked Phoenix, like, as a person. And, like, I feel like I got along with him. And there was, like, an episode of preseason that we did where, like, he was just, like, really just kind of being an asshole to Mark. I felt like we went, like, really light in, like, the eye into what happened there. And, like, right, it popped off. They were just like, oh, my God, this kid's being so toxic and blah, blah, blah. And it was just, like, after that was, like, a really big, like, okay, I need to look at this from, like, the most, like, lowest comprehension, like, context. Like, I don't get it. Like, I don't get the intricacies of these yes. relationships level so that, like, you know, maybe piglet rolling his eyes or double lift like not saying hi to someone won't be like oh my god double lift didn't say hi to jensen he must hate him haha ha, this team is gonna die it's just like chill out like it 
it takes time, I think, as a content creator to like read through the Reddit comments and read through the Twitch chat to see like, oh, this is like how, like, n- this is, I'm trying to not be rude. This is the least amount of brain power that I'm going to put in to thinking about this topic. I just want to lull at something, right? Loco, I have a question for you, right? Because here's the thing. It, what, what I'm amazed at is, cause obviously some of the moments, like when you break the keyboard, are such like they stick in everyone's memory. Yeah. You get you get mad about breaking point. What amazes me, dude, is I actually think you came off looking worse in the TSM Legends series because in that series, like again, actually a lot of it was like minor details, like Damien saying here. Like, I'll, like here's the thing: there's never actually an episode where you and Bjergsen have a big argument. Mm-hmm. But if you just look at his tone and the way his facial expression is when you're explaining stuff, like there clearly is a lot of like passive aggressive tension there. And sometimes he doesn't agree, but he doesn't want to say it in front of. But like, there's a lot of that shit. And I have to say. Like, there's so many episodes where Reginald just cocks the fuck out of you, mate, when he just comes in and then suddenly he's taken over and he's the one talking to the team. It's like, even if that's not, like, drama outright, like, it did make you look bad in a way. So I'm amazed you're not, like, resentful of the TSM Legends stuff. Well, for TL stuff, I actually thought I was a really good coach during, like, the TL era because TL gave me three rookies and two Koreans that, like, just did not work with the team and that were, like, dysfunctional. And I took that team to game five versus CLG. And I think I was runner up for coach of the split that year or runner up for coach of the split in the spring split after that happened. I was either second or third. It was like me, Tony and like fucking Dylan won it. So like, I was like, okay, this, this award is a fucking sham. So I thought I was a really good coach because I don't think anyone else in my position would have been able to take that team in spring split and get them that far. Sure. And in yeah. summer, um, Damien doesn't have to speak up on this, but I thought management was really shitty in how they helped me deal with Dardoch and how they actually enabled Dardoch to be more toxic. Of course. Because they thought Dardoch was the future. So, Dude, just look at that part in Breaking Point when Steve is like literally letting Dardoch disrespect him to his face. I'm not joking. I would fire the guy instantly if a player was like that to me. Like when he's literally like, come on, dude. Like it's like, what the fuck? I'm your boss. You know, I own this whole company. Okay. I'm rich as fuck. So in the TL and I'm super fucking fu- pissed about like the TL days because like majority of TL fans hate me where I thought I was a fucking blessing to the org where they got a coach that coach didn't work out they got a second coach that coach didn't work out and I randomly stepped in and took fucking nothing I had three players that's never ever played a single game in challenger before not LCS they've never had a fucking challenger split before and two dysfunctional Koreans and I took them to game five versus CLG and if things went a little better we make finals like <laughs> I, I thought I was fucking god to coach. I thought no one else could have done what I did. So that's why I get really pissed about that here right, okay. because it's re- remembered as breaking point. And by the way, I will say, team. I actually think for that split, I actually said the same thing. I think I actually picked that for me, the two obvious candidates for coach of the year were clearly Zix and you. Like, come on, man. No one even knows what Del Falco did because it's just fucking Hooney and Rainover, wasn't it? Like, they already did that without him. Mm-hmm. So I, I was like, that's why I'm super pissed about that TL year, because I think that was a year where after my mistakes in TSM, I learned a lot and I thought I was a better coach. And I thought the story and the, I guess my storyline to the public should have been local improved a lot from TSM, but it's look at TSM and now look at TL, two dysfunctional teams. What's the common denominator? Oh, local doko. Local doko can't work with star players, Stardock and Bjergsen. And for the everyone team, in the chat right now, story writes right. itself. Uh-huh. Exactly. I, listen, I don't read the chat, but I'm going to say this anyway because I'm assuming Loco does. Right? Everyone in the chat right now, tell me, would you watch a documentary where he actually narrates it like he did in that voice there, where he's like, "Loco, Loco, in this episode, he's trying to get into TSM's good graces, but they think he's fucking shit." Like, we all, or you can hire me and I'll do my impression of Loco doing that impression. Let's make it, Damien. He's just giving us all these great ideas, mate. This, I think he doesn't know it, but because. Because here's the thing about Loco, actually. We can talk about this, to be fair. Because Loco referenced it there, that he actually wasn't the first choice to be Team Liquid's coach. And it just so happened that when, obviously, they ran out of coaching options, they just hired Loco as the content creator and he was doing that content. Were, were you actually the guy working with him on that shit? Uh, I was, like, one of the people. They... It was a contractor <laughs> named John who... Uh, he, he actually does a lot of really nice commercials now, so much improvement from the local videos. Like, um, that was when Loco literally was a motherfucking tourist to the content creation yeah, he world, was, because he, was, he actually uh, thought making content was, he sits down, someone else records it, someone else does it all, he just talks, at the end he goes, when's the video going to appear then? 
Like, I realize hanging around Travis, that probably yeah. does seem like what the content creation life's like. But actually, you know, the rest of us learn skills, like basic video editing, mm -hmm. putting some hard work, edit shit, you know, start like actually thinking stuff up, have our own YouTube channel, manage it, you know. Right, Don't right. just have a slogan so, at the end. So I remember, uh, I remember when Loco got like uh, kicked out of TSM, basically, right? Mm -hmm. He yeah, was like, day. hey, yeah. you know, like, uh, I didn't really, t I, I talked to him occasionally, but he was like, hey, I was living with the COO at the time of TL, and uh, he's like, hey, guys, like, I don't have a place to stay. We let Loco live with us. Um, we started helping out with his channel. We, like, developed all this stuff with him, and I remember, like, the coaching stuff, like, wasn't going well, and I was, like, so bought in on the Loco train that I was like, wait, why don't we, and I was talking to the manager, who I think was Nick at the time, right? Yeah. No, it was Joka, Joka. Nick oh, it was Joka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, hey, what if we like make Loco the coach? He was just a coach. He did pretty well at TSM. And everyone was like, looked at me like I was an idiot. And then like three weeks later, it happened or something like that. Yeah. I, I knew you were. I fought for you. Uh, I, I fought I, for you. Uh, dude, I definitely <laughs> shouldn't have coached again. Oh, my God. Coach, what? It's I, all my fault. No, it's not. It's, you know? not, it's not your fault, but. I mean, coaches in this phase, it's, it's fucked to be a fucking coach right now. You have to work more than players. You get paid less than players. You get none of the glory. Like, I mean, coaching is in a garbage position right now for, I feel like, League of Legends. Cause, not because like, coaches are treated badly. Players are so fucking valuable because there's only five players playing. Star players mean so much. Coaches, the amount of impact they can have is very little when the pool of players is so small and you can't like really bench players, move them up and down. I do think there's like great coaches that are able to deliver really good results but the amount of control and the influence coach has versus like a player has outside of like very specific situations i think is so tiny and yeah do you think coaching space sucks do you think reaper would agree with you i think reaper had a chance to get canned when cloud nine um replaced jensen and sneaky outside yeah. of reaper's control things could have gone worse for them and they not made worlds. They could have just flunked completely. There was a chance that Reaper could have done everything in his power and control to make things do well. And things could have blown up on Reaper's <clears throat> face. He could have done everything textbook, like been the perfect coach. Things blow up in his face. And the first thing people are going to say is, look at Reaper. He benched Jensen and Sneaky and look what happened to Cloud9. So that's what I mean. Like, I want to be somewhat control of my own destiny and like have influence and in, like, how i mean you're gonna get judged on your results right and players just matter so much more so i i do think reaper would agree with me like there between me and reaper like we talk about quitting coaching i mean i i already quit but reaper talks about like how stressful it is all the time and like how coaching in na specifically is extremely stressful i actually have a question for you damien because i don't know if you can remember this but when I actually first met you in real life, this is actually a story I've told like it's separately. People know the context that I get because it's where I referenced a story with Loco, where when I came to NA to do those interviews for Cloud9, you and uh, another guy, Michael, it was Michael Atras, right? When was yeah, it yeah. the two of you? You guys at the time were the ones producing this video because I assume Jack talked to you and said like, you know, you guys do it for a certain fee or whatever. And Jack arranged the whole thing, et cetera, because it was for like their sponsor. It was very interesting. Like, HTC, okay. Yeah, yeah. This is before they had their own site then. <clears throat> so when they when we did this content, that was actually the first time I'd met you. This is the way local. I think on a past episode told that story where like local came up to me at a party and was like, "Hello, Thorin." I was like, "Fuck off!" And he was like, "What the fuck?" And I was like, "Get the fuck out my face!" And then like, and then, you know, I wasn't even joking either. But <clears throat> anyway, whatever. That I had that you know that fucking drank in me. So <laughs> anyway, so here's the question, right? Since you said you actually worked with Azubu, I don't know if you remember this story. But didn't you tell me some mad story? Like, one of the reasons you joined is that they told you, like, oh, yeah, and when you join, actually, we've just signed Thorin. Like, you're going to be working with him on, like, his content, you know? And then, because what happened was, at the time, I actually had been in negotiations. When I got fired from on gamers. initially, I didn't know I would go independent because I thought there was no money in it. I was going to try and join another site and get, like, a big salary, like, get all the yeah. pay in one go again. That, like, that seemed like the right model, right? So Azubu was someone I was talking to. There's a couple of other sites around the world. <laughs> And with them, I actually was like thinking about the Azubu one. Like, oh, they, obviously, they had a bad rep in their own way. But the guy who was talking to me, you know, was selling me on a lot of good stuff. You know, well, the difference is you guys can turn that around. You'll have the real money, etc. So I was thinking about it. And the problem is, because he thought from the way our conversation went, that like I was like this close to signing, and you know, it was just formality. Which I didn't. I never gave that impression off. But maybe he thought that. 
I actually was was kind of like, yeah, I was maybe 10% and I was like, I said, I'll think about it. I've got to listen to all my offers and I'll do it. I know internally though, someone must have heard, oh, Thorin's joining. And then they did actually fuck up because famously they sent out an email to some people in the industry that was like, because you know, at the time, Azubu had that deal with Kesper to have the first Korean right, stream. Right. And they had this fucking press release they sent to someone that was like, and we're going to have world champion Faker and industry leading content creator Thorin Shields. It's like, I what? I, how am I reading this? And I haven't even agreed to that. So is that true? Did they actually like, what, did they try and lure you in by saying I was going to be there? Because obviously I wasn't. So if, if it was, I wrecked you on that one. Uh, so, I mean, like, the reason that I joined Azubu, because it was like my one and only offer at the time to like actually get okay. paid fully <laughs> sure. in esports. Fair like enough. I was pretty much getting paid like, I don't know, like $50 a week to go to LCS and shoot stuff. So it was like ba barely covering like my travel. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like, uh, previously I had like worked at Nickelodeon for like almost a year wow. and like I had gained a lot of experience there and like filming, but then I left to follow like graphic design stuff. And so I was like trying to get back into video production. Um, and so they just caught me at a weak moment in my life, you know? Um, but they, yeah, there was like a whole list of like really big talent that we were supposed to be working with. Like I, uh, I mean, will be very offensive for like hardcore esports fans but i had no idea who like tasteless and artosis were at oh, the time yeah. but like you know everyone was like oh they're fucking huge they're like part of the thing like we'll be making content with all these people and i was like oh this sounds like amazing like there's going to be so many opportunities and it did lead to opportunities right because like i got to work with clg and curse sure. and that's like where i met peter and you know like have the job that i am now but yeah it was definitely a little bit of a bait but uh, at the same time, I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. Sure. Okay, right. What about this then? So in the early days, as we've alluded to, even if actually, I have to say, because one of the great things about the 21st century is just how the baseline technology you need to make things like content has gotten obviously in like almost exponentially cheaper. Like if you go back to the 1980s, like a documentary is going to cost like literally 10 times what it would cost to make now. Obviously you can in theory nowadays, in fact, the cameras are so good on phones now, you can in theory shoot some of it there. Yeah. If you did a good enough job editing, maybe someone wouldn't even know, you know, as long as you don't move it too fast or whatever. Right. Obviously, even though some of those early documentaries look pretty slick, you know, for esports, they look like nicely produced, the music's all good, etc. Now, things must be at a totally different level now with the resources available, right? What's it like now if you make content? So, I mean, I'll give you a little example of what it was like then. So then, like, heading into, let's say, like, doing the first piece that I was doing with Curse, um, like, documentary-wise, I had, like, one DSLR camera that was supplied to me by the company, a mic. And then I spent probably like a good $800 of my own money invested into like a higher budget because we didn't have the budget at Azubu to like get a higher tier camera. So like I went out and I wanted to level up the content and I just didn't want to have to deal with like getting budgets and things approved for months and blah, blah, blah. So I just like bought something. And so then I had a two camera set up so I could do two camera angle interviews. And it was really like, uh, you know, like real shit. <laughs> Like working by myself, um, you know, having the team manager sometimes help me like hold the camera or like set something up or hold the light, like that kind of shit. Or, uh, you know, just like really bootstrapped. Where now, um, I think majority of all LCS teams are like shooting on FS7s, which are like triple the cost or quadruple the cost of what the cameras we were previously using. We have like lens kits that's at least, you know, like a $4,000 kit per camera and it's just like two to three people depending on what team you're involved in um like your interviews are set up pre-scheduled you're not just grabbing someone in a hallway after a game to try to get your content for the show it's like a huge you know like if you would have told me that that was happening this quickly back then i would have told you that like you're insane and that the industry wasn't ready for it um but i think a lot of the pushing that tsm and teal did over the last two years like at least on the team side got it there like for me it was a lot of aspiring to be as good as riot was my goal then um i can't speak to what the goal of the content team is now but i know very much last year was like okay i think we're almost at riot level now let's like try to be at like netflix or like other like very well-funded documentary sure. levels you know, by the way, actually, there's one question I have along that. Since I was talking about that period when I came and did those Cloud9 interviews, right? I'm just going to straight up say it, right? This is flame, Damien, but I got to say it. 
I came to LA from fucking Korea on a long haul flight to do five interviews. Count them. One, two, three, four, five. There are five players in Cloud9. I was doing five interviews. I came there. I did the five interviews. All five of them, by the way, are like pretty much like one of my like grilled or reflections interview. They're like pretty in depth, you know. I'm asking questions about the whole guy's career. Only three of them ever came out because two of them were like broken from the sound. There's some mad shit like that, right? What happened there, man? What happened to my interviews? Uh, I won't blame anyone but myself, and I'll say that okay. uh, that <laughs> I <true> captain, yeah. <laughs> I didn't check uh, some audio equipment that I should have checked before we started. Yes, I was so checking. Yes, I was like so embarrassed after that. I was like, "Fuck, yes. man, that's like Thorin." I watch all of his videos, like, and we just fucking just shit. Like in my head, like as we were preparing them, I was like, "This is gonna be so much better than any of, of the shit." Yeah. Like, this is going to shit on his, like, bedroom interviews. Like, he's the gonna... By the way, in theory, it should have, because, you know, we had lav yeah. mics and proper two angles, and we were in a seat. Like, obviously, man, back then, if you remember, for people who don't know, I used to, when I filmed them, have a, a, a thing where I was just a guy behind the camera. I, you never even saw me. I was like, so what do you think, Double Left, about the Eddie Cat? Like, you know, like, the production value was shit on my stuff. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And then and then we didn't do that, you know? <laughs> you know the sickest part? We had the it. visual there, but no it's, audio. What people don't know is the reason why I bring that up is because it wasn't just like I did an interview after the LCS and you couldn't re- upload that. Two of the people I did interviews with was one was high and the other one was sneaky. And I'm not joking. Those interviews were actually fucking amazing. Like, I, I even yeah, think the sneaky good. one was like actually pretty interesting at the time because I, I made him like, I pushed her on t- topics like, you know, are you overrated or whatever is double lift. But like, I actually got a lot of the shit you'd want to know, but it just never came out sadly because of someone who wanted to be an artist but doesn't deserve to have art in his name. No, that's too harsh, actually. Whatever. You get where I'm going out on, but the flame was pure. Whatever. Uh, I, I, it, I don't think it was Archers. I think it was the other person okay. that was on the show. Right, okay, it was the but third unnamed. person who remained unnamed. unnamed. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, wait, Damien, I have to ask you about, I guess, kind of relationship with Max and how your viewpoint on TSM Legends. Like, you speak well of Max for doing um, TSM Legends by himself. It was insane. Like, Max would film us, and then he would edit. <laughs> And he would be dead in the morning and then he would do it the next day. I always thought Max was one of the hardest working people in um, TSM. Like, what do you think of the earlier TSM legends, like the early season ones? I, I'll, I'll preface with this by saying when I asked Max about the earlier TSM legends, he said it was fucking terrible. He said it's one of the worst he's done. I think a lot. So I feel like uh, this feeling makes me feel like I'm getting old, which mm-hmm. I am in esports years. But when I look back to the old stuff that Max and I did, it feels so much more personal than a lot of the stuff that's coming out now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just like because of how the space is evolving that what I was talking about earlier, like a lot of these content creators aren't like sleeping in the same places or living in the same as all these players. And so it's like there's not that for a lot of teams, Mm -hmm. um, not every team, but there's not that like one-on-one connection like you're not going out to drink with players after ones that are old enough um (laughs) you're not like gonna go get pizza or sushi or korean barbecue with everyone like sometimes people just come in they do their job and they leave Mm -hmm. um and so i feel like the genuineness uh in those older episodes for tsm legends and for rebirth Mm -hmm. are there but like the production shit the audio is like pretty bad the like you could tell that there's two different cameras because like Max or I didn't know how to color correct. He was way better at it than I was at the time, but it's like this camera's green and this one's pink and like the room tones are totally off. And like, for some reason, you know, Piglet's audio sounds really clear because he was wearing a lav, but then like Phoenix's audio sounds like shit because it's like from the boom mic or like the mic sitting on top of a camera that's in a corner. Mm -hmm. And so there's like a lot of like really like embarrassing, like, oh my God, how did I let that air kind of moments? Mm -hmm. But I do feel like there's a genuineness to a lot of this, which I feel like, you know, a lot of people say for a lot of YouTubers, like, oh, when your stuff first came out, it was more genuine than it is now or Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. You know, but uh, there's like a happy medium that I think people are starting to get to to sort of figure it out. 
One like if I had to, I, yeah. I would just say on that, by the way, as a general, like a meta <laughs> comment is I think the reason people have that phenomenon is because <clears throat> in the early days when you haven't learned on your, worked on your craft and you don't have the technical skills to a very high level, the only thing that will make a person watch is that they're interested in you or the ideas you're talking about. So the, what I think the problem they're seeing there is, first of all, the novelty might have worn off. Maybe they're just not into your stuff anymore or as interested. Secondly, I'm sure in the early days there was barely any content. So like, for example, that's why everyone remembers games. Game Cribs fondly. Game Cribs is a fucking dog shit documentary. Even Sully would tell you that. It's one guy with a camera and he's just doing what he can and he has to fill an hour every week. Like, it wasn't a great documentary. You would, don't go back and watch it now. You won't enjoy it. There's not much interesting shit in there. Just the drama. That's it. But the point is, like, first of all, people, when more and more options come out, are going to, they're, they're going to vividly remember Game Cribs because it was the only one. If there'd have been 10 and nine of them were better, you'd, you'd go, who gives a shit about that? And then the other aspect is, whenever you add in any like production, and especially when you get popular, there are always people who just have to be like, oh, I'm not, I used to like the early stuff, but you know, I don't really fuck with like the more commercial shit. It's like, meanwhile, they're just popping in their iPhone, listening to fucking Drake, sipping a fucking spiced pumpkin latte in Starbucks. Like, yeah, okay, homie, you don't like shit everyone else likes. It's mass produced. Anyway, I don't know why I put that whole rant in there about like, it's just sad <laughs> fan of but whatever. <laughs> There's a super fucking interesting story. I think you're gonna love this story about Game Crips and me. I'm I'm not involved in Game Crips in any way, but there's a story about Game Crips and me okay. that I'll tell on the hundredth episode of the show if it makes it. <laughs> if it makes it to hundred <coughs> episode, I'll tell the story. I think it's one of the craziest. We have to wait seventy eight episodes. Yeah, if we make no it more. Isn't this twenty one? We have to wait seventy nine episodes. It's, 20, it's actually twenty two. Trick two G was twenty one, so this one's twenty two. Oh yes, you're right. Okay. Yeah. That's so true. if we make it to hundred episode, I'll tell my game crib uh, game crib story. I'll I'll tell you this. It's right. worth it. You're gonna like it. All right. Right. Well, as a surprise, on the one hundredth episode, I'll reveal whether I actually was racist on any of those comments I said over the years. So. <laughs> okay. Just keep that in suspense, you know. Whatever. You get the joke. Keep oh, going. <laughs> Damien, since you're wearing TL merch and that's part of your job, let's talk about like merch for teams a little. So uh yeah, go for it. I mean what do you like what's like goal with TL merch and like how has like merch involved? Because it used to just be like you get a t shirt, you stick a logo on it, and that used to be merch. And so, yeah, what do you think of merch nowadays? Like and specifically of TL merch and we can talk about Hundred Thieves and TSM in a little bit. All right, so I'm going to go like way back, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, when I was young, um, very young, uh, actually, hold on, I'll give you a visual reference. Like that young, um, that's me and my mom. Uh, <laughs> my mom, Keep going, my yeah. mom used to, uh, to work in the fashion industry, probably mm -hmm. up until I was like about 14 or 15. And uh, so I was like always around fashion in terms of like I knew what like uh, like Paris Fashion Week was, I never went. Um, but like, uh, she wrapped some lines like Hudson jeans and like a handful of other things that I just don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but she was like very involved in it, and so like fashion has always like been very interesting to me. Um, a little weird as like a fat kid to say like fashions are inspiration. Um, <laughs> Because it's hard to find it's a lot of cool shit. It's to be fair, I actually. Interview. To be fair, there are some people in America, maybe not like super obese people, but people in America who are fat. I'll give them credit. They actually go ham on their fashion because they want to be all swagged out, like you know, velour track yeah, suits. Yeah, yeah. And you need to have the. If, if you're really fat, you've got to have the baseball cap, the fifty nine fifty, like the classic edition, like the rare one. You know, you've got to have the fucking straight, the red Octobers. You, what you're gonna do is you've got yeah. to swag all the accessories out because obviously, you know, the fucking the car's not a sick one. It's like putting a. Spoiler on a fucking Honda, in it. <laughs> That's the analogy. Uh, and so, um, a lot of that, uh, like, carried over into high school. And, like, uh, I started doing, like, random graphic design stuff in high school. And, uh, like, real embarrassing, but also kind of sick as fuck. Uh, thing that I did is, like, in the MySpace days, you know how people used to put, like, brackets of, like, their crew or whatever? Yeah. Right. I had this crew called Fresh, uh, which was, like, the dumbest shit, uh, now that I say it out loud, right? But, like... Uh, I just like made some graphic design thing and I had fresh and like me and my friends made like a couple shirts and then all of a sudden like all these people at school were like oh like do you mind if we put the bracket in our name and blah 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 and can we get a t-shirt okay. and it was like this thing and we were like oh this is kind of cool and it never went anywhere it was like happened for like maybe a year and then like people graduated and it went away and it wasn't a thing and other things became more popular but that was like my first like oh one day it'd be really cool to do like a t-shirt line or like clothing or whatever right mm -hmm. so then fast forward like later years i'm like running this random like tech blog 
and we started doing merch and like we sent stuff to like Jessica Negri and she like did like a photo shoot in it and I was like, oh shit, like we could do merch. But then like we were just like too dumb to figure out how nice to name drop. I'm a big fan. Yeah, big yeah. fan of her Instagram. <laughs> big fan. Um and we like couldn't like, figure sort out. like her, her Instagram's sort of like the Mona Lisa. I can just spend hours looking into a picture trying to figure out what's going on, you know, thinking about it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, keep going, uh, keep going. I, I wouldn't know. Um, <laughs> I haven't talked to her in a while, but uh, I was like, you know, we're like, oh, we're going to do product and we're going to ship it out and blah, blah, blah. And then none of us owned up to it and it like never happened because we didn't have the capital, blah, blah, blah. So esports stays, right? I start doing all this video content. Um, we like start our partnership with Jinx. Uh, I was like, hey, like I'd love to be involved in like pitching items because this is like a thin thread that was like somewhere uh, having to do with me in my life. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'll, I'll forever say this everywhere. I don't think that I'm someone that's like inherently, like I'm going to pull a, an idea out of thin air and like come up with something completely original. I like to look at a handful of things, like figure out why I like this thing at a distilled level and then fuse those together to make yeah. something new. And like maybe I actually think in esports, by the way, that's actually the best approach because there's not that it's like that famous thing. There's no new things under the sun. There's not that many totally original ideas. But obviously in esports, where you know there's all these things in sports like documentaries, it only makes sense to try and see if that works in esports, right? Yeah. And so with merchandise, I like started giving advice for like jinx stuff here and there, and uh, you know ultimately a lot of the creative was in their hands. So when our partnership ended and it was on us to figure out if we wanted to keep going with jinx or like do our own thing i was like hey can we please do your own thing because i would love to just sort of like work with our graphics team and creating stuff that was like specific to us and like maybe ride some more of the waves of like special events or special jerseys and there was like timeline limitations uh, attached to the previous contract so we like went on our own not for my decision but yeah i i hope that my voice was heard in that um and so it was like, okay, well, we're on our own now. And so we didn't have a store for like a good four or five months. And it was like, we're going to MSI. Um, like, what what are we going to do? And I was like, oh, I want to do like an American jersey, but I want to do like a really subtle colorway. I don't want it to be like some big stars and stripes because I think that stuff's really lame. Um, uh, no offense to America. But, uh, you know, I, I did a simple edition of a red trim on the jersey. Or G2. Uh, it, yeah, you, you know, they have a great store. Oh, uh, not my taste, though. Uh, and I like I like the subtlety, right? And I was like very into like Adidas and like shoes at the time, and you so like are. I was I was very well. I, I I waned off, and now I'm back on it. But I like started to get <clears throat> to the concept of like subtle colorways of things, and like every time a jersey came up, I was like, oh, I'll do it. I'll do it. like I'll I'll help lead this. Blah blah blah. And so it just turned into like. Um, not only myself, but I was working with Josh, who's our art director on a lot of this stuff. And so we started feeling like, yeah, like we could actually just like run, I think, merch by ourselves. Like we don't have to go to a third party vendor. And so for the last three to four months, like obviously we're going to someone to get it manufactured. We're not like sewing it ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, after the last couple months, it's just like us. Like I spent probably a good 12 hours the other day just like sliming out designs for the next couple months not to just like get stuff out there but just so that like i have a visual board um and that's really what it's been the last couple months is just like what do i think the space is missing how are we unique in it like we're not trying to copy anyone um but it it, you know like uh, unfortunately for like optic and like a couple other people that did it, like releasing the baseball Jersey last year turned into like, you're copying hundred thieves and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, I think some of that stuff is a little ridiculous. Sure. Like hundred thieves doesn't own uh, Texas on an arm. Optic doesn't own green. It's not like no one could ever make something green because optics green. And so like, I think a lot of it was. TSM doesn't own months. the concept of being evil. Well, that's look, um, <laughs> Not a two face, yeah, correct. <sighs> so <laughs> we, as of recently, we've started to feel like we could really like not care about mm-hmm. uh, the like four or five comments that are going to say like this looks like this, this looks like this, and really just like what can we create that like <clears throat> is interesting to us. So like the thing that I'm wearing right now, like obviously has reference to like off white, like haha, yeah, I get it. Like they do patterns down the arms also. But there's also like a little more importance in it, and like there's three here and three here, and there's six mains, and it's mm-hmm. part of like a representation 
Um, I really miss out on the opportunity of doing these the opposite way because then you could liquid the fuck up, which is something that randomly started becoming popular with our Fortnite team of them like trolling phase phase up. Uh, but that's like its own thing. Um, and then this is like the coordinates to our not our actual office, but like coordinates to Los Angeles, coordinates to Utrecht. Um, and so it just became like, uh, like what are things that mean something to us or to me or to the person that's designing it? Um, why do we think it'll do well? And uh, do we really care that much if people will get it or not? I think we're leaning towards the, like, we're not necessarily sure if everyone needs to get everything, um, but we want to like start having more of a, uh, a voice in more than just like, hey, we want a trophy. It's like, hey, we want a trophy. And our staff are doing talk shows like this or representing themselves in different communities. Or we have a cool merch line that has nothing really to do with our protein other than the fact that Doublelift was wearing it, right? Like being a creative in Team Liquid, I actually feel is like something that isn't there in every sports team. Like we have a production company. Not every sports team has a production company. We have like a pretty staffed graphics design team and all those people have their own voices and their own visions. And so a lot of this year for me is like really not just players. And this feels real weird from like an org perspective, but I think not just players should have a voice. Like I think, you know, maybe we see Steven Victor more this year. Maybe we see staff doing more things externally because I feel like part of the esports problem uh, for teams, at least in terms of like fan retention is... Like, if Double Lift leaves, all the Double Lift fans go. If you give them nothing to care about, mm -hmm. but if while Double Lift's here, they find out that they really like the one-up content, even if it had doesn't have to do with League of Legends, or they really like the merchandise because like it was super comfortable, or maybe they thought it was super sick, or maybe like we release an anime shirt in two weeks and they're like, oh shit, like they get anime, like Team Liquid's an anime, or you know, like all those touch points, I feel like are important. And not just like on a financial, like give me money level, but like on a, as a creative for me, the finances like are never important, which is like probably my biggest flaw in terms of like business operation. I just want to make like cool ass shit and I want to make cool ass shit with my friends. And luckily like at TL, I have a lot of friends that I get to make cool ass shit with. Hmm. So that's kind of like where I'm at and why merch became important. Cause it's like, I always wanted to do this thing. I have this vehicle and where like a company trusts me to create these products. Like I don't get to just like release every single thing that I think of. Sure. Um, there's certainly a gate, um, but it's really more of like a artistic Avenue. Like there's certainly going to be stuff that's like pants for the team. Okay. Maybe that's not that artistic, um, but we're trying to like trend in different ways. You know that actually if people have ever seen on my social media, like I've posted loads of times when I was wearing like a Team Liquid jersey because they made all my name on and I had like the hoodie and I have the t-shirt and I've loads, actually I have loads of Team Liquid swag. And what's funny is, right, that actually all comes from the guy you mentioned earlier, Jocker Steve, who's now the manager of the CSGO team. When I was at an event once, right, I had like a Fnatic shirt because I used to be friends with a guy from Fnatic called Khan, who's like one of the head people. Mm -hmm. And so since I was friends with him for years, one time at an event, he was just like, oh, there's a T-shirt, by the way, like, if you want it. And the whole point is, if you travel to events a lot like we do in CS, you're always just taking whatever T-shirts are in your closet because you've got so much stuff to get the drying and washing done. It's like you just take whatever you've got. So on travel days, for example, you just wear whatever's comfy. You don't give a fuck. It's like might be like a free memory T-shirt that some Corsair gave you or something, you know. The idea is you're not wearing it for fashion. You just wear it for whatever reason. Well, I was actually doing that one day at the CSGO event, right? And I had this Fnatic shirt on that just was the Fnatic logo. And Jocker Steve kept saying to me, like, how much are they paying you? How much are they paying you for that? And I thought he was joking. So I was like, well, obviously nothing, you know. He was like, no, I'm serious. Like, do you have like a deal in place with them? And I was like, no, they just gave me a t-shirt and I was wearing it. And he goes, so you're telling me if I gave you a Team Liquid shirt, you'd wear that? It's like, yeah, don't see why not. I like Team Liquid. He's like, all right then. And then that's just why they gave me all that shit for free. So people don't realize. It's actually one of the things I think a lot of, Team Liquid is way ahead of the game on this, you know. If I was a team owner, like 100 Thieves, like you mentioned there, I would be giving all like personalities and big name people oh. like free shirts and stuff. Obviously, you want them to wear it on a stream or to be wearing a, in a picture. And it's actually a great way to sort of like passively market into the scene. I think it's pretty cool. I had a project um, from Andy and Lena. I don't think they'll mind because it's been years where they told me to get 40 or 50 people in esports doesn't have to be um, League of Legends related, but get a list, reach out to them through either my Twitter or TSM Twitter if they don't <coughs> already follow me, and get their address, phone number, and just send them free swag. And this was done like 
when I was on TSM, so it has to be 2015 or 2014. So TSM sure. was already doing that like three or four years ago, like um, actively like giving out swag to for people to wear. And people fucking loved it. Like TSM was the most popular team back then. Like it's a lot more competitive now with TL and 100 Deeps across a lot of esports. But TSM was by far number one back then. And it was something like they are they were already like actively like systematically doing. Like, put it yeah. this way, I, are you telling me if I made a post now on my Instagram where I was just, like, I didn't say anything, it was just a picture of me wearing, like, the current TSM jersey, mm -hmm. you think people wouldn't just lose their mind? <laughs> of course they would, that, that, that picture would be straight viral instantly, yeah. mate, in esports, e obviously. Mm -hmm. Like, that one picture, I, you know what, I know what, because I've sort of made up with Reggie, it sounds hypocritical <laughs> to say this, but do you remember that picture that someone posted from when Monty and Reggie met in real life again, where like, I can't remember why they were in LA for some reason, but they were, maybe they were there for like an MSI or some shit, but there was a picture where like, it was Monty and Reginald together, like, and I literally just even messaged Monty privately, like, do they have ever been as disappointed in a person in my entire life? Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, that's the enemy. What are you doing? You're normalizing people like that. Like, I didn't read the last part of the joke, but I, I, I was disappointed generally. I was like, how are you gonna do that? Damn, you're so petty when it comes to things. Of course, I'm fully aware of that, mate. I'm entirely aware of that, you know? <laughs> Oh, I kind of want to talk about like, so 100 Thieves merch, like they have a very, very clear idea on like what they want out of their merch. They want to be hype beast. Um, a lot of their stuff draws inspiration from hype beast, like the patterns and stuff. And definitely the limited release is very, very hype beasty. Like, what do you guys think of like, I guess, certain themes with certain orgs? Like, I would say Cloud9. Cloud9, like, their Twitter is really meme and some of their t-shirts are really meme when I think Cloud9 stuff. I generally think well-designed. I love the, I really like the white and blue, like, the overall um, jersey and, like, the hoodie. But some of their t-shirts um, were a bit meme I remember. What do you think of, like, teams taking certain themes with um, their merch and stuff? And specifically with 100 Deeds, what do you think of the whole hype beast approach? Um, so I think the, the story, the script that I read, the other day was that C9 and TL are supposed to be enemies. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you that the C9 jersey was literally just a rip off of our jersey, just in a different way. Mm -hmm. So you could say that it's sick, but it's a copy and paste with their logo. Mm -hmm. So that's cool, I guess. Um, that was actually I, how they got Jensen in a Team Liquid. They said, like, here's your new jersey for the season. He was like, oh, yeah, right, the same thing, the right? oh shit, I'm not in Cloud Dan. This is Team Liquid. What the fuck? Oh, I'm uh, so sorry, Jack. So anyway. I think a lot of their, um, their method for their merchandise is a shotgun. It's like a mini uh, C9 Hot Topic. Now, if you shop at Hot Topic, um, we'll certainly also be making stuff for you this year. Uh, but <laughs> I think like <laughs> if your only goal is a Hot Topic drop, um, that's not super cool. But I mean, they have you know arguably a bigger fan base at the moment, so maybe that's the way to go. Um, I think the Hundred Thieves like hype beast uh, sort of thing is cool. Um, I think nade shot like as a personality that's like part of you know it's if he was a puzzle piece, that's his that personality a huge piece right yeah. and so it's very authentic and genuine with him mm -hmm. um and people that are fans of nade shot and watch his vlogs and the million plus followers that he had were ready to jump on that train right mm -hmm. i think if anyone tries to make that their only vehicle it's just going to be a huge miss like if c9 tried to do like a super hype bc drop for everything like if they cleared the store out right now zeroed it out right there was nothing there mm -hmm. except maybe a keychain and then they were like hey by the way our 2019 jersey is going to be 95 dollars." their fans would fucking lose their minds right mm -hmm. but because they have so much other stuff in the store if they had a 90 it would be premium so like it could potentially work for them but 100 thieves fan base has been like whipped into knowing like you be there on drop day or you don't get it and don't say shit because I don't care and we're not reprinting it. And like that was a message from day one. But any other org that doesn't have that, it's just like you, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so our approach is like we literally have a line called Basics Line that's always in stock. It's always there. Like it is literally just a logo on a t shirt, like what you'd expect from a sports team as one of their pieces of merchandise. Different colorways, like it's there. Cool. Um, our jersey is always going to be in stock. Like, you know, it's literally not in stock right now because we took the store down to restock it. We're actually launching it tomorrow with the new jersey. That's a little plug for myself in there. Uh, <laughs> okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, teal.gg slash store. Uh, <laughs> and so the 2019 jersey will be available. 
squad shirt that's going to be available. Uh, but the jersey should forever be in stock. Like, outside of, like, we win the major in CSGO and all the C9 CSGO fans that were like, America, uh, C- C9, blah, 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 and are like, actually, fuck that. Stewie's on the team. Let's get it. Like, I love Twist. I love Naf. Like, that are going to go and buy out the store. Like, unless that happens overnight, that jersey should never go out of stock. Because that, for us as a team, we feel like a fan should never feel like, oh, well, I have to wait three months to, to support my team. That feels like shit, dude. Like, if anything, as a fan, I want instant gratification. Like, how do I get it right now? Yeah. Where do I drive to to buy it now? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not like uh, we want those, like, instant buys. It's like, as a fan, we should be able to facilitate that experience for you. That was always one thing, you know, I was always amazed. Like, this just shows how, you know, this year everyone's praising Riot for, like, all the sponsorships the different regions are getting and, like, how they've expanded stuff. People don't realize, like, they were so fucking lazy in the early days. Like, how was there not, from the beginning of the LCS, a fucking a pop-up store that was outside every time there's a game day that sells the jerseys of all the teams? Like, how that is not a thing, I don't even understand because, I, like you're saying, the kind of person who becomes a fan on a TSM, they want to buy the jersey now while they hate the fucking stadium. They don't want to, like you're saying, no one wants to wait three months and then have it come and you forget about it. Oh, there, there it is. You know, like it's not, it's not as cool like a, a moment. You know, you want it to be when you think of it. Yeah. Because I always thought one of the most undervalued aspects of esports in this respect, and actually some of the double of stuff has played into this a bit, was it is ridiculous how many amazing personalities and stream personalities we have that didn't have t-shirts with their slogan on in some way. Like, double had it with, like, the everyone else is trash when he was in CLG, and obviously now he has the Atale stuff. But, like, the amount of them that weren't done is amazing because those would sell, like, hotcakes, in my opinion. Like, mm-hmm. those are the ones. Like, I'd, like, as opposed to having just a T-shirt that in some way has the face of, like, Sneaky, if you make it, like, remember that meme where he used to just go, like, same and just say same all the time? Like, mm-hmm. if you had one where it was, like, hey, if I'll, you know what? I, this is how fucking good I am, mate. I'll give you right now a straight fire example of what you would do if you were doing a sneaky t-shirt. It would be three pictures of sneaky. There would be one picture when he's in Cloud9 in 2013. It's a same. There'd be one picture when he's in Cloud9 in 2014. Different jersey. Same. So it's a same, same. Then there'd be a picture of him in his cosplay as a female League of Legends character, and it would say different. And it would meme on the bit from that fucking movie, the interview or whatever it's called, that one way they go to North Korea. And he's like, same, shame, but different. Like when he does that speech. Look, I didn't know the reference. So whatever. He didn't get it. But you see what I mean? You, you get the actual quote and you, you put it out there. Hmm. Why is that not a bigger thing? It's still not that big now, really, is it? It's not really that many teams do it. I mean, turnaround for merch. Um, can take a while for teams and also I I agree with you like merch would sell really well for League of Legends stuff and esports stuff in general so because I'm the like producer and like the I guess market person for the show so I do a lot of I attempt to get a lot of sponsorship and one thing I do tell sponsors is um, the buying power and the willingness for esport fans to split with their dollar is a lot higher than other people um, someone else helped me with the stat in it but yeah, like esport fans are much more willing to yes. spend and they do have more spending capita than other generic fan bases. By the way, I'm going to say local. Like there's another thing that we're going to definitely do in the future. Once this show is really huge, we're going to have our own hype beast type shit, like local mm-hmm. X store in and it's going to drop. There's only going to be like a hundred of each mm-hmm. time and it'll be like some crazy shit that happened on the show. It'll be like a slogan. And the whole thing is when you see someone who has that shirt, you'll know they're one of like the insiders, but we'll, we won't do the full release. We'll start limited. And then eventually when I really want money, we'll just do it for everyone. Every, all the idiots can get at that point in time. Yeah, right? Let me, I'll, I'll facilitate that for you. All right. it, it'll be a new side project. <laughs> for sure, for sure. I mean, we're okay. getting near to the end of the episode. Doran, um, any topics? Damien, any topics that you guys wanted to do? Uh, right, we'll do one last topic. But actually, that does remind me. I didn't say it because at the time he was telling stories. So I didn't want to interrupt his floor too much. I did actually crack up though when he was telling me about how when he was a kid he was in like his mom was like in the fashion industry or something because I just had this visual right of like him when you're in when you were in Team Liquid him like doing a photo shoot with you and you know that like classic 60s style photographer who's like okay okay I want to see you like this now now on your knees okay up you know what uh, fuck it let's play around a little bit with this and then he's like you're, you're ferocious you're an ad carry oh my god you're you're in frost and it's, it's outrageous you've lost the finals you've blown it all you've 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 ruined it for the whole team <laughs> but now you're in a new team you're in clg oh it's bloody crazy that's right oh there's my life look my life's in the bush reach for him reach for him you're just like, <laughs> you know, like i would love to see that if you can make Wait, that as an side video we did a so. christmas shoot where he put me in like an elf costume and he's like oh hold the present this way <laughs> Imagine Santa's that feels here. like that, that feels like an unreasonable request. 
Not our finest moment, okay? I that does seem like that. a reasonable request. Yeah, hey, Loco, could you just get in this uh, elf outfit for a thing we're doing for Christmas? So wait, Loco, Loco, I, I didn't tell you about this idea. You're cutting out. Thing. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, See, so, so that other thing that we were deeming before uh, before this, mm -hmm. I wanted to do, uh, I, I know that this is so like inside, like you don't know what we're talking about, chat. Loco was going to work on a project with TL. It didn't pan out specifically, mm -hmm. but part of like the preface to that project, you remember that scene from Avengers? Uh, I think it's Avengers, the second one. Oh, the like Loki, the Loki, Loki. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I yeah. wanted to well, do he's a like, scene. you must be pretty desperate to come and see. Is that what you're gonna do? Yeah, yeah. I was that would be put, fire. Yeah, I was gonna put Loco in the in the glass cage. Of course. Yeah. So so maybe you could reconsider the offer, and then we could do it just for the sake of that video. Yeah, I. <laughs> funny enough, though, the two teams that I kind of talked to for something similar were TL and TSM, and then. I, I'm just sitting here thinking, oh my god, I'm down to do it, and I don't have any kind of beef with TL or TSM. It's just the fan bases are gonna be fucking rabid if I ever come back to any of those teams. That that's why we would preface it with those memes. But I think only TL could facilitate that. Okay, well. only TL, <laughs> for yeah. sure, for sure. Dorian, any other topics you want to cover? I, I think we covered a lot. Okay. I think it was pretty good. Oh, I did want to ask you, Damien, what's like. What was it like doing the international comment or the inter TI? You guys did the TI, right? For TL <coughs> when they won. Like after doing like years and years of like force, forever force, forever force. And then we had the year with me, like with breaking point. And then we had the rain over year, like the double relegation year. And then you got to do TI. Like how different was it doing it for like a losing team? And then like, I guess like a successful part of TL. It was, it was uh, very surreal. So the year before I had gone to TI, I think it was TI six, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we got like fourth or eighth or, or some something not very good. Like that team in theory should have at least made it. I think it might have been even worse. I think it was like seventh to eighth or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's pretty far down there. And uh, there's this interview that I did, and my time of man was actually the opener <laughs> for the champion yeah. series. But he talks about like you know like maybe it wasn't this year, like it wasn't meant for us, blah blah blah. But like eventually it'll come to you. And so, like, during that tournament, um, that whole thing was, like, going through my head. Because uh, as, like, a documentary filmmaker, you have to, like, think about these things and how do they intertwine with, like, other narratives and pieces that you have and how do these different pieces fit into the puzzle. And then you have to think about, like, well, what shots do I get to support this and can I do a match cut and blah, 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 and all these technical things. And so the entire time I was, like, looking at different opportunities to sort of represent these older interviews that I did to bring it into like a full, like, this is the experience of the team and this is how we went. Um, and so the like limiting factor that we had is that that team was very particular and we're like, they had never had us in bed with them before. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know what it was like to have us there every day. So we weren't there at the same level that we were like League legends where we're going with them to get food. We're in there as they're screaming. Um, were there like afterwards it was very much like hey come to this time of this time you can do interviews and you can shoot some of practice and then you have to go um which you know like maybe that worked really well and so like the entire time right on the same timeline as we're like doing well at the international we're trying to fight our way out of relegations mm -hmm. so like i have on my phone yeah. or on my laptop i have like the lcs matches like thinking just like, oh my god, like, okay, cool. We won that game, we won that game. Like, oh, it keeps cutting out. Yeah, we can't it, it keeps right coming now. out. Oh, is it? Yeah. Hello, hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Do, um, what is it? If you're using the blue mic, right? The blue yeah. icon should be facing you. Because oh. it's, um, it's a, what is it? Stereo mic. Yeah, it's got the whole around, doesn't it? All right, well, that, I, I'm going to... You know what? It literally sounds 10 times better as a mic right now, because you obviously were just speaking in the wrong side of it, so... Great, well, now I know. Now I know uh, where that interview went, right? So <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not an audio guy, okay. <laughs> what was the end of the story anyway? Uh so I'm like watching the the team like win, right? And just like crush kids for the most part through it. There were like some games that like uh maybe we're not gonna win this one. And LCS is like doing okay, like getting through relegations. And the final day, I'm like sitting there. I'm more worried about the LCS game in front of me. Because, uh, like, if we win, I think, like, we're 100% not relegated, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
than I am actually our team that's in like the third, fourth place moving to the finals match of the international. And it was like such a surreal moment for me because I'm like down here on my laptop. I'm worried about us not getting kicked out of the league. I'm more worried about this than I am about these guys winning the world championship. Mm -hmm. And it was like, we didn't get kicked out of the league was like an intense moment of joy. I was like, playing locals team. So we yeah, took yeah, yeah. To game, we took them to game five. They had 10 right, times our resources that, and we took them to game five. That was the scariest part, right? Is that we did go to game five and it was just so stressful. And then as soon as we weren't relegated, like everything else just didn't feel real. Mm. I was like, uh, like we could lose now. Like, Third place is great for the international, dude. We See, that's what sucks, you know. People always try to diss local by saying he took lo he took Team Liquid into relegations. But you also got them out of a relegation as well. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> it, was, it was me and Double Credit where credit's due. It was yeah. me and Double F doing. Exactly. Yeah, credit where credit's due. I'll, I'll say this. When Team Liquid was under me, we were very bootstrapped in budget. And we were never even close to relegated. What if it, we made playoffs every single fucking time? When I left Team Liquid, or when I got kicked from Team Liquid, and they got their influx of cash, and they could pay Rain over how much they wanted, and build their <laughs> roster how much they wanted, double relegation. What the fuck? No reaction. Why are you guys both no <laughs> dead fan? Yes, yes, I agree. Double relegations, uh -huh. <clears throat> and then also became multiple time champions. That, Sorry, what? It took a Sorry. it took a year for them, even with influx of cash, to fill the hole that yeah, was well, left by Loco Doco. Obviously, when you leave, you know, people are going to have a year where they're like, what was I even thinking with that guy? You know, I need to just take time away from dating and like find out who I am as a person because I keep picking all the wrong guys, you know, like. So anyway, and then they come back after some yoga retreat. They're like, oh, right, why don't we just recruit good players? Double lift, come on in. Sure, sure. Anyway, that's the end of the episode, I think, right? Yeah. I mean, Damien, any kind of shout outs, anything you want to say before we end the episode? Uh, shout out to Team Liquid. Uh, make sure to check out our store relaunch. Uh, teal.gg slash store tomorrow and uh, subscribe to the Team Liquid YouTube channel. They're doing a bunch of really sick stuff. They release like this hype thing uh, for the split start, which I think like rivals some of the stuff that Riot did that launched today, mm. which is pretty crazy. And it has Thorin in it. It does. It has Thorin's voice. They were like, they're like, oh, what caster bit should, do you have any advice? I was like, oh, Thorin video about the Jensen thing. Like there's some good bits in there. Sure. Okay. For anyone who doesn't know, by the way, because I actually do get asked this. Funny enough, in CSGO, people always ask me because when people make frag movies in CSGO, they want to have like the part where you're waxing lyrical, like, oh, he's so sick, you know, he's incredible aim. And that, that does sound cooler if that's over the top of the frag movie. I've always told people this. Anyone who wants to use a section like that for one of my videos, I'll never copyright strike your channel or right? anything. You can, you, you can do it. Like, as long as you're not literally just taking my whole video, if it's just you taking a little segment and use it, yeah, use it. Do it for whatever the fuck is cool. Cause the thing is, I'm like a fan of hip hop music, and that is literally one of the things that famously ruined hip hop music is that you can't just use any samples you want. Now you have to get them cleared. Like, so I, I think it's cool when people do that. I think it's a good way to also like connect all the scene together. You know, okay. I like it. I agree with that. All right, cool. I'll end the episode here.